Hello everyone, my name is Peppermint and welcome to the very first ever Black Queer Town Hall in Science, Technology, Engineering and Mathematics or STEM. The first day of this town hall is focused on conversations between Black queer scientists on how we can make STEM a safe space for everyone to be out in the lab. The next three days is focused on Black queer scientists and all the amazing work that they do to help us understand how the world works and how it impacts our everyday life. Our first speaker is a pioneer in LGBT neuroscience and was the first to discover that the structures of our brain match the gender each person identifies as. And that is determined during development. Sounds about right to me. <laughs> He's also published many studies that support that sexual orientation is also determined during development. Now, they have received their MD and PhD from the University of Amsterdam and went on to be director of the Netherlands Institute for Brain Research, professor of neurobiology at the University of Amsterdam, and was the founder and director of the Netherlands Brain Bank and is now department head at the Netherlands Institute for Neuroscience. He has been cited over 34,000 times and is here to talk to us today on the biology of gender and sexuality. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Dick Swab. Well, hello, America. I don't know what time uh, this will be broadcasted, but uh... It's now in the afternoon here in Amsterdam. And the first slide shows you a boy who is playing to be a soldier in China. He became a very famous uh, dancer. And uh, during his dancing in Paris, he found out that he was homosexual. And later he changed his uh, gender. And you can see uh, here uh, with three adopted children at home in China. So this makes us wonder what is determining our sexual orientation and our gender identity, the feeling to be male or female. Uh, if we talk about sexuality, then there are different uh, aspects to distinguish. Uh, gender identity, so the feeling to be male or female, and uh, the topic of transsexuality and intersex. Sexual orientation, so whether you are homosexual, bisexual, heterosexual. The uh, age of the partner who is an extreme in pedophilia, pedosexuality, and the level of sexual behavior being asexual or hypersexual, even have sex addiction. And I'll touch upon a couple of uh, those aspects. Well, the first question you can raise is why do we uh, reproduce in a sexual way? because some organisms like this little Daphnia is splitting up in two now and then. And that would save, of course, a lot of uh, trouble if we could do the same thing. But uh, uh, when the um, circumstances become difficult for Daphnia, so if there's not enough food or, or too many species in, in the uh, environment, uh, then Daphnia is uh, starting to exchange DNA. So it's uh, starting to uh, reproduce in a sexual way. And that is because it is increasing variation. And uh, when the variation is increased, there are always a few uh, uh, specimens uh, that can survive the changing circumstances. So the, the reason for sexual reproduction is to increase diversity. And the diversity is also seen in all aspects of sexual behavior. Um, this shows you in the most simple way, brain development. And you can see here the amount of DNA, that's the number of cells plotted against the age of the child. And here the vertical line is the moment of birth. And you can see that there is an enormous increase in the number of cells until about the age of five, six years. And then we have most almost all cells that we will use for the rest of our life in our brains. But that doesn't mean, of course, that the brain is mature at that moment. And if we follow then under the microscope, the process of sexual differentiation uh, in cell culture, you can see here two cells. 
One is stained for its uh, neurotransmitter yellow and the other one red. And three weeks later, those same cells are showing here the yellow one, the red one, and there is an enormous network of fibers formed around those two cells. And I hope you can also see the blue dots here, which are the contacts, the synapses between the cells. And in this way, in a very short period of time, the brain is formed. The adult brain is one and a half kilogram. It contains 100 billion neurons, which is about 12 times more than there are people uh, walking on Earth. And each neuron is uh, making contact with between 1,000 and 100,000 other neurons. We have 100,000 kilometers of those fibers in our uh, brains. And that means that uh, the network is so complex that it cannot be programmed into detail on the basis of the information on DNA. And I'll show later what the solution uh, is for that. Well, I'm talking about the mind, and the mind is the, act the active network of 100 billion nerve cells. There are also people that talk about the soul, and the soul would survive death, would be immaterial, and according to other people uh, weighing 21 grams. Uh, from scientific point of view, we have never found any evidence for a soul, because so I'll talk only about the mind. And if we follow brain development uh, in, uh, in utero, so um, halfway gestation, we can already see that there are differences in molecular uh, aspects uh, of the developing brain. This here is the um, Y chromosome. Girls have two Xs, boys have XY. So the Y chromosome is uh, specific for uh, men. And if you look then uh, to the expression of the genes, that means the genes are active, halfway uh, gestation, then you can see the yellow bands. Quite a number of genes are already actively expressed uh, during halfway gestation, uh, so in the womb. And the areas in the brain which the, uh, um, um, in which this takes place I mentioned here. You can't read it, but it's not important. It just gives the message that there is a molecular difference between brains of boys and girls already during pregnancy. Um, there are quite a number of aspects uh, uh, of brain development which are genetic and also resulting in genetic aspects of our behavior. For instance, when we measure IQ in uh, adulthood, 88% is genetic, determined by our parents. But uh, there are also um, other aspects. Uh, and on top of the genetics, you will find uh, already in the womb uh, processes that makes every brain different. If you look to those two children, they were scanned just after birth. Uh, and they are identical twins. And that means that they have the same DNA. But if you look to the brain, then between P and the arrow here, there are one, two, three gyri. And here between the P and the arrow, there are one, two, three, four gyri. And that means that the brains are different at the moment of birth, although the genetic uh, background is the same. And the process that is responsible for that is called self-organization. And I'll give you an extreme example of uh, self-organization in this identical twin, which is a Siamese twin. They have uh, one body, each has one arm, one leg, and they have two heads. And when, uh, they had, uh, when they became 16, the question came up, would they have to uh, get one or two driver's license? And the decision was made, two heads, so two driver's license. But the important thing I want to show you is uh, at the end of a small movie um, in which um, uh, they tell us that they are totally different individuals. It's just an ordinary Monday morning in the Hansel household. 
Gabby and Brittany aren't morning people, and I think uh, that's primarily because they have a harder time getting to sleep at night. It's fine. Don't touch it. So they do a lot of tossing and turning at night, and, and the bed is pretty much destroyed every morning. And so getting up in the morning isn't their favorite part of the day. Every moment of their lives requires the twins to cooperate with each other. Each action is a display of perfectly coordinated teamwork. They appear to be totally in sync, but that doesn't mean they always agree. Believe me, we are totally different people. Abby is more into like pink and girly and puppy, and Brittany's more not into pink. So Abby is more into pink and girly, and the other one uh, not. And that means that uh, although they have the same genetic background, and although they have experienced exactly the same things from conception onwards, they became different people by self-organization. Self-organization in the brain takes place by finding uh, the right contacts. And the right contacts are the contacts that uh, are found at the right moment, not too early, not too late, and strong enough to bring uh, growth factors from one cell to another. And then those uh, contacts stay for the rest of our life. And the contacts that are too early or too late formed, they disappear. And after that, uh, the cells also disappear. And we make five times more cells than uh, we will keep in our brain uh, during adulthood. And that means that uh, this process uh, is uh, making every brain different. It's not unique to be unique. Everybody is unique. And uh, this process is also um, important uh, for the variability in our sexual uh, behavior. Well, in the 60s and 70s, it was thought that playing behavior in children, which is uh, uh, different for boys and girls as a group, uh, was caused by the social environment. Parents would uh, stimulate one type of uh, behavior and inhibit the other type of behavior. Well, I didn't believe that so much, so I have given systematically um, uh, dolls and, and cars to both of our children, a girl and a boy. And the girl was only interested in the dolls and the boy only in the cars. But two uh, children are not enough from good publications, so we were very happy with Alexander and Heinz who uh, decided to do the same experiment with young monkeys. And then it was found that uh, the female young monkeys uh, took by preference dolls and the uh, male young monkeys looked what you could do with a car. You cannot um, uh, keep the idea that this is under pressure of the monkey society. So it is uh, evolutionary uh, old um, uh, difference between the sexes which is expressed very early already in playing behavior. And it's caused by a testosterone that is formed, the, the male hormone that is formed in the second half of pregnancy. And it is uh, causing a differentiation of the female, uh, the uh, male uh, brain into the uh, male direction. And if there is no testosterone, then the brain is uh, developing in the female direction. And this is apparent uh, from, for instance, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. That's a condition where the adrenal of a girl is making too much male hormones, too much testosterone, and then they differentiate in their behavior uh, also in the male direction. That's uh, clear from uh, the uh, drawings, spontaneous drawings at the age of uh, five or six. For instance, you can see here two panels of two girls and girls uh, prefer as a group to draw uh, other girls in bright colors, uh, pink and red and yellow. Um, boys, uh, the three uh, panels here, uh, they uh, prefer to draw uh, soldiers, but not shown here, but also transport means cars and, and trains and in darker colors. And a girl who was exposed in utero to more testosterone is making at the age of six years uh, the boy type of uh, drawings. Uh, we have studied this type of uh, differentiation of the brain in uh, uh, the brain tissue itself. And you can see here uh, the queen, the Dutch queen, 
was thinking whether she will leave her brain behind for our study. And what we found in the um, uh, 70s was the first difference, sex difference in the human brain. And that was in the hypothalamus, that's a brain area that is important for the production. And the difference uh, was found in what we call the sexual dimorphic nucleus, which was twice as big in the uh, males as in females and contained twice as many cells in males as in females. And this has given some uh, problems in the feministic uh, movement those days. Um, one of the leaders, Jokert Haas, said that if I would accept that there are sex differences in such fundamental properties as the anatomy of the brain, I can stop talking as a feminist. In fact, that was the last time that he heard something from her. And since then, uh, many, many studies have shown sex differences in the human brain. It should be um, emphasized though, that it's not a matter of uh, just a female or a male brain. If you study the different brain areas, then some of them in males are more to the female side and in females more to the uh, male side. And in fact, again, every brain is unique in this aspect. There is what we call a brain mosaic, which is uh, uh, showing uh, differences in terms of male or female characteristics in different brain areas. As I said, there is a peak of testosterone in boys in the second half of pregnancy, and this peak is causing the brain to differentiate in such a way that we will uh, have a gender identity of male or female or in between for the rest of our life. It's also causing uh, our sexual orientation to differentiate to heterosexuality, homosexuality, or bisexuality. Uh, after birth, there is a second peak in testosterone in boys. In girls, there is no peak in, in sex hormones in the second half of pregnancy. In uh, the postnatal period, the first three months postnatally, there's a peak in estrogens, female hormones, and then it's quite until uh, puberty, then the sex hormones are going up and then the systems that are formed in the brain in uh, the womb are activated. So then sexual behavior and aggressive behavior becomes overt. And we can um, uh, follow this process step by step by um, mutations that take place some, sometimes. And there's an example of that. Those two women came on television in the Netherlands and they felt uh, that uh, they were uh, heterosexual women, but their genetic background was XY, was a male. Uh, they appear to have a mutation in the testosterone receptor. That is the protein that receives the information of male hormone, testosterone, both in the body and in the brain. And the mutations uh, make the um, protein um, not binding to, uh, the, to testosterone. And that gives a differentiation of the body and the brain into the female direction. Although they produce a lot of testosterone, testosterone is not acting on brain development. And this shows how important the interaction between uh, the male hormone testosterone and uh, um, the brain cells is for gender identity and for sexual orientation. Um, well, this uh, um, shows a child of 10, a very female posture and developing in a young girl. Uh, but uh, Manon uh, knew, it was born as a boy and knew already at the age of two that uh, uh, he was born in the wrong body and he wanted to change his sex. You can see that uh, in uh, the age of 16, uh, he received uh, female sex hormones and developed in a young woman. Um, she was operated and uh, also uh, shown here at the age of 27 years and became a beautiful woman. Well, this is transsexuality. And the theory about transsexuality was that since our sex organs are developing in the first two months of pregnancy, and sexual differentiation of the brain takes place in the second half of pregnancy, that two uh, 
uh, those two processes can be um, influenced in a differential way. You can influence one process without influencing the other. And if this would be the uh, background of uh, transsexuality, then you would expect male structures in female brain and the other way around. And that's what we found uh, indeed in the first place in the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis, which is an important structure for uh, sexual behavior. And if you look to um, that structure un under the microscope, you can see here an heterosexual male and here an heterosexual female. The structure is smaller and has less of those black points. And the black points are terminals, are synapses of fibers coming from another area that is important for sexual behavior. This is a homosexual man. And you can see there is no difference in size or in the number of black uh, dots uh, between uh, heterosexual and homosexual males. This is a male that is genetically XY, but isn't transsexual, male to female transsexual. You can see the structure is small, it's of female size. And when we determine the number of uh, neurons, the number of brain cells in this area, then in heterosexual men, it was 35,000 in homosexual men also, in heterosexual women, it was half the number. And in genetic males that were male to female transsexuals, uh, you can see there is a female number. Here is a female to male transsexual. There's a very high number, a male number of cells. So this is a reversal uh, of the sex difference in the brain, in the human brain, that agrees with a gender identity, uh, the, the way they uh, feel their own uh, gender, uh, but it doesn't uh, agree, of course, with the birth certificate and the passport. Those have to be changed. And uh, our research was um, uh, uh, resulting in change in, in law, for instance, in uh, the parliament in uh, London, in England. And you can see here the bill is about transsexuals, a significant group of people in our society who in a phrase, are deprived of the ordinary protections of law. Whereas one of the main reasons why the flavor of the debate has changed is that science has at last begun to play a real part in our understanding of what transsexualism is and how it arises. In November, so that was uh, one year before, the neurobiologist and they uh, made my name invisible of the Netherlands and international colleagues. Those were my Chinese uh, students at the Netherlands Institute for Brain Research in Amsterdam announced and published the postmortem study. And that's the study I just showed you. And it resulted in the change of law in different countries. So it made it possible to change the birth certificate and the passport of people. Well, how is the, the chance determined to become transsexual? Well, the, um, uh, there are different factors involved and they all have to do with the interaction between uh, the um, um, developing nerve cells and the sex hormones that is, are produced by the child. So there are mutations in the receptors for sex hormones uh, medicines that are interfering with, uh, um, the, uh, with the sex hormones during pregnancy. There are hormones produced by the child or given by the doctor. There's an interesting observation on the number of boys born before a boy. The more boys bef that are born before a boy, uh, the higher the chances that the boy becomes transsexual also homosexual. And the um, explanation is an uh, immunological one. Uh, when the mother is pregnant of a boy, then the boy is producing proteins that are produced on the base of the Y chromosome. And those are considered to be ch strange proteins by the mother. And she is acting as if it is a virus or a bacterium. It's making antibodies against it. And every pregnancy, again, this, this process is stimulated and becoming stronger. 
Well, then the question here is, is the social environment postnatally important for our gender identity? And the answer is no. Um, in order to illustrate that, um, I want to introduce you to this little girl who was born as a boy. Had one small problem, and that was that the opening of the foreskin of the penis was too small. And then there are problems with urination, and after that problems with kidney function. So the foreskin of the penis has to be removed. And this uh, uh, was done in an uh, operating theater in Canada. Um, and they made a mistake there in the sense that they uh, did not burn a little blood vessel that was bleeding. The equipment was um, not working um, according to uh, uh, how it should be. Uh, they burned uh, away the whole penis of the child. And then, because it was in the 70s, and it was still thought that it was the um, uh, social environment that was important for um, development of gender identity, it was decided to make a girl out of this little boy. And uh, you can see here, it was dressed up as uh, a girl, got uh, dolls to play with, got uh, psychological uh, guidance by John Money in Philadelphia, and was uh, treated with uh, female sex hormones in puberty. Um, and uh, some uh, 25 years ago, when I said, well, this is the only example I know uh, from the publication of money that it's possible to change gender identity postnatally, uh, then somebody stood up and say, well, uh, I know this person, and uh, it was Milton Diamond, a sexologist, and the person has uh, changed back into uh, manhood. And you can see uh, here, and that means that uh, you can do everything you can imagine. You can remove the penis and remove the testicles. You can dress a child up uh, and uh, give uh, uh, psychological guidance. You can give uh, female sex hormones in puberty. You do not change gender identity because it's programmed in the brain. It is put in the, the hardware of the brain, in the structure of the brain. You cannot change it after birth anymore. Well, um, he um, uh, got a lot of money with the book I showed you. Uh, he married, uh, they adopted uh, children, but the uh, marriage was uh, breaking down. He lost the money on the stock market and he committed suicide in 2004. But this story shows how permanent that uh, sexual differentiation of the brain in the womb is. Well, the same uh, story holds for uh, sexual orientation. You can see the famous uh, first same-sex marriage in Amsterdam, the picture that went uh, all over the world. And you can also see that there is some progress here in Taiwan, uh, two girls marrying in a Buddhistic environment. Um, well, when we try to uh, find um, uh, the involved brain structures in, uh, scan, in scans, even with the most powerful scan there is the seven Tesla, we could not uh, uh, see uh, those brain structures. So at this moment, uh, the only means we have uh, is the experience that uh, people tell us. Um, sexual orientation is also determined um, uh, in the womb by the interaction between sex hormones and the developing brain cells. There are genetic factors involved, which take care of about 40% of uh, the result. And there are hormones involved. Uh, chemicals uh, like uh, nicotine. So if a mother is smoking during pregnancy, then there is uh, more chance for a lesbian girl. Some hormones like thyroid hormones have an effect. Fraternal birth order effect I told you about. And when there is serious stress like during um, war or a divorce or the death of a partner uh, during pregnancy, then it's also influencing a sexual orientation of the child later. And again, one can wonder whether there are postnatal uh, social factors involved. 
And the answer is that we didn't see any evidence for that. Um, this shows a study in uh, Karolinska, Sweden, by Savage, and she has put um, uh, people, uh, groups of people, in a functional scan. And then uh, when the people don't get any task, you can see uh, the connectivity between brain areas um, uh, because uh, the functional connectivity is shown when the same um, activity changes take place in one and another area. The same moment the activity is going up and down. And when you uh, look for connectivity in the left amygdala, then for heterosexual males, there is no connectivity in other brain areas. For heterosexual women, uh, there is connectivity with the other side and a couple of other brain areas. It's homo for homosexual men, it's the female pattern, and for homosexual uh, women, it's the male pattern. But there are also differences that are not a reversal, but are just uh, differences uh, in relation to sexual orientation. Well, uh, also for sexual orientation, uh, we can say it's uh, stable for the rest of our life. And we can say that because uh, the last hundred years, uh, people have tried anything you can imagine to change homosexual men into heterosexual men. There were female hormones given, male hormones, testosterone, was castration performed, uh, testis trans transplantation, of course, psychoanalysis. There was a compound injected, apomorphin, which makes you really sick and you start to vomit. And that was combined with homoerotic uh, pictures, with the idea that if you make uh, the connection between homoerotic pictures and vomiting, you uh, will become heterosexual. Well, the only effect was that when the therapist came into the room, the man started already to vomit, but he didn't change his sexual orientation. There were electroshocks given, induction of epileptic seizures, there was depth electrodes placed, and of course in many countries still there is prison. But nothing, nothing has changed sexual orientation because it's programmed in the brain in uh, early development before birth. Well, this shows uh, an example of uh, the 1500 species in the animal kingdom that show homosexual relationships. Uh, there are pink winds uh, described in, in New York, but also in Germany, that form homosexual pairs. And they were even breeding out uh, eggs and uh, taking care of the chicks in a good way. Um, the same holds for humans. You can see here some examples uh, from the Netherlands in same-sex uh, uh, couples that take care of adopted children. Uh, this one is uh, one of my former PhDs, a neurologist. And uh, those children are followed for a long time already and they are doing very well. Uh, they are doing uh, in psychological testing even better than the rest of the population, which is no wonder because uh, the same-sex couple had to pass many uh, barriers uh, before they could uh, accept uh, children. Um, and. Uh, the, the interesting thing in terms of this uh, presentation is that sexual orientation shows the same uh, distribution in uh, this condition where the children were adopted by uh, same-sex uh, parents than in the rest of the population. And that is again uh, in agreement with uh, the idea that it's all determined before birth. You cannot influence that by the uh, social environment, even not if uh, the social environment is an excellent example of uh, love between uh, two same-sex parents. So in order to conclude, uh, it's often said that nature makes mistakes, but nature doesn't make mistakes. Nature produces a lot of diversity. And I've told you in the beginning that diversity is meant to uh, uh, survive uh, the uh, variation in, in the environment during evolution. Uh, Milton Diamond has uh, put under his uh, uh, males, uh, nature loves variety. So that's the evolutionary aspect. Um, 
it's a pity that society hates it. So um, that is, uh, of course, the, the, the basis of many problems. We don't uh, choose to become heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, transsexual. Uh, it's all decided before birth. And uh, that means that uh, if we want to uh, have a uh, um, pleasant life, we have to choose the life that is fitting our brain as it has developed uh, early in, in, the, uh, in the womb. We cannot change the brain, so we should uh, change the uh, society in order to let them accept diversity in all, uh, in all its aspects. And um, um, we need the freedom to uh, live in a way that uh, is adapted to the way our brain is uh, developed. This is not a uh, really new idea. Uh, if you come to Amsterdam, you can see the statue of Spinoza, philosopher of the 17th century. And uh, he uh, stated that everybody should be free to think and say whatever he uh, wants to think or say and to live the life he wants to live. And the obligation of the state is to guarantee this freedom. So the state should not tell us how we should live. The state should guarantee our freedom in all our diversity. Um, I've uh, written a couple of books uh, for general public and the idea is to uh, do something about the taboo and the stigma of uh, diversity and also taboo and stigma of uh, brain disorders. Um, and I think that the only way is to explain uh, how beautiful that machine is, the brain, but also how complex. And if you know something about uh, brain development, then uh, you are amazed that it's uh, going well in uh, quite a number of cases. And you are not amazed that it's uh, giving problems in terms of psychiatric uh, disorders in quite a number of uh, people in society. And you are also not amazed about the enormous diversity in uh, brain development. Uh, every brain is unique and the diversity is also present in uh, sexual, in all aspects of our sexual behavior. Well, thank you for your attention.
that was a fabulous talk by Dr. Swab. Thank you so much. And I think raises some key points that can be used to dispel any notions that gender is fixed and only based on what sex we were assigned at birth. Now, our next speaker has done some incredible work to increase the visibility of queer scientists around the world by founding 500 Queer Scientists, which helped us find some of the speakers that we have speaking at this very event. Thank you. Dr. Lauren Esposito received, received their PhD from the Museum of Natural History and Arachnology, and then went on to do postdoctoral fellowships studying the biogeography of scorpions in the Caribbean, and is now the assistant curator and Schillinger chair of arachnology at the California Academy of Sciences. Say that 10 times fast. Now, please welcome Dr. Lauren Esposito. Hello, I am Dr. Lauren Esposito, and I am the founder of a visibility campaign called 500 Queer Sciences. I want to talk to you today a little about uh, the importance of visibility for LGBTQ plus people working in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and allied fields like teachers and people working in policy uh, and anybody really associated with the fields that we call STEM. So first I just want to start out with telling you a little bit about my own journey because I think what I've discovered over the years since starting this visibility campaign in 2018 is that my story is not unique. It's actually pretty common. Uh, and in many ways, that makes me feel so reassured because now I've realized that all of the things that I felt like were hardships and, and um, things that I had to overcome as a result of my identity as a queer person, I've come to realize are things that everybody or many people, let's not say everybody, but many people uh, in similar positions to myself uh, have also felt or faced. And I think that that highlights both the fact that we have a lot of work to do, but also the fact that it's important for visibility campaigns like 500 Career Sciences to reach out across the internet and tell people that they're not alone, that there's others out there that have had similar experiences uh, and have a, there's a place and a space for them to, to work as STEM professionals, but also a place and a space for them to get some support and the support that they need from, from others. So I, I currently work at right here in San Francisco, which is like, I think probably the gayest city in America. And I am uh, working at a public museum called the California Academy of Sciences as a scientist. Uh, the California Academy of Sciences is this beautiful natural history museum. Uh, and what's great about it is that it affords me as a scientist this opportunity to interact with the public in ways that I wouldn't necessarily have in more traditional academia like working at a university. And what that's really great for visibility because it allows me as a queer person to go out into the public and show people that it's possible to be intersectional, it's possible to be queer and still be a scientist. Uh, and, and that's been like a fantastic experience for me. Um, certainly it is something that drew me to this institution because for me as a scientist it was really important for me to be able to do my science but I also felt this fundamental commitment or responsibility to share my science with the world and so being at the Cal Academy affords me that opportunity. So in case you've you've never been to the California Academy of Sciences probably in the case of, of many or most of you uh, or you've never had the opportunity to visit a natural history museum before they're wonderful places they're places that really inspire the imagination. Um, our, at our institution we have like really traditional sort of European settler colonialist dioramas like these uh, African lions down in the bottom left corner. But we also have other things uh, that include living organisms like uh, the largest living coral reef aquarium in the world, a living rainforest dome that is full of plants and butterflies and birds, uh, a penguin colony that's part of a species endangered species recovery plan for South African penguins, uh, and a planetarium that creates shows uh, using people that formerly worked at places like Pixar that now want to communicate science to the world. So it's a really awesome place to work and an incredible opportunity right here in the heart of San Francisco, a place that's like what queer wouldn't want to work in the heart of San Francisco at an incredible museum. And so when I was hired as a, as a scientist, 
I was pretty surprised to learn that I was the first openly queer curator in the history of the institution. The, the institution is actually one of the oldest natural history museums in this country and in the world for that matter. Um, it's 167 years old. I think this year we'll, we'll celebrate our 168th birthday. And in that time frame, I'm the first openly or likely not openly curator um, in the history of its walls. And that was shocking. That was sort of a shocking revelation to me to realize that I was alone in that sense. And that I was alone in the sense that I had no other queer colleagues uh, that were there to share my experience with me. This is really the section that I work in. This is a natural history collection. Um, I'm the curator of arachnology, which means that I study things like spiders and scorpions, things that make most people a bit squeamish. Um, and I'm tasked with uh, understanding and maintaining this sort of so-called library of life on earth that contains jars that are little tiny time machines into a time and place on earth where that organism lived. Uh, we also have dry collections. They look something like this. They're stored in drawers. Um, and all in all, we have about 45 million objects in our collections. Uh, so it's a pretty massive collection and it's a monumental task to not only care for it because we want these things to exist in perpetuity, um, but also to, to do research on it. We use cutting edge techniques like genomics and uh, 3D imagery to like CT scanning to be able to understand and unlock the mysteries contained in each of these specimens. Uh, the organism that I study is scorpions in particular. Uh, and so if you've never seen a scorpion up close before, here's your, here's your opportunity. Um, and, and scorpions I, I find are these really incredible organisms. And I will say that I was never really excited about scorpions as a kid. I mean, I, I remember growing up on the border of the US and Mexico, seeing scorpions in my backyard and being scared of them, which I think is probably the reaction most people have. But for me, they're incredible organisms to ask questions about the history of life on Earth because they've been living in uh, ecosystems on land for about 450 million years. So that's before most flowering, well, that's before all flowering plants uh, and even before the dinosaurs. Um, so they're great. So they're great for that. Typically, I spend a, a lot of my time out in the field, which as a queer woman uh, has its own concern. So here's me in, in, out in the, in the open country of Arizona, which, as you know, is not friendly to uh, people of color, nor is it particularly friendly um, to queer people. And so in doing field work, both here domestically, but also around the world, I have challenges that many of my colleagues are never presented with. Um, and so that, that's yet another aspect of it being a queer person and having a queer identity in STEM that makes my job more challenging. I have to have hard conversations with colleagues and collaborators about places that I can and cannot go and, and or places that I need to have like special security considerations to go to to ensure my safety and the safety of the people that I'm working with. I'm, another concern is that I do most of my research at night uh, using an ultraviolet light to detect scorpions. They glow this beautiful green color uh, under ultraviolet light, which makes it much, much easier to find them in the dark. But I don't necessarily just work in, in places in the desert. I, I also work in places all over the world. For example, this is a, a tropical rainforest off the coast of Africa um, in a region called the Gulf of Guinea on the island of, of Principi, which is a um, UNESCO biosphere reserve uh, looking for spiders. Uh, here's me in a, in a stream that's covered in giant boulders uh, on the island of Penang, just off the coast of, of peninsular Malaysia. Here's me in a mud tunnel uh, in the Choco region of Colombia. But in spite of all the, my travels and all the places that I've gone around the world, I think it's really where I grew up and where I'm from that has informed the, the most, the biggest aspect of my queer identity. So I grew up here uh, in, in the border of the US and Mexico in a city called El Paso, which is right across the border from Ciudad Juarez in Mexico. And growing up in El Paso, it, it was an incredible experience as a child. Uh, it was a period of time where, where our borders were not as restricted as they are today. And so the people of this metropolis comprised of Ciudad Juarez and El Paso 
really were fluid across the border. We, we went to Ciudad Juarez to go grocery shopping and to buy coffee because everybody knew that that's where the good coffee was. Um, and people came to El Paso conversely to shop at places like Walmart where they could get cheap um, home goods uh, that simply weren't available in Ciudad Juarez at the time. So there was this, this, this metropolis, this experience and this culture that was ingrained in the Hispanic culture, the culture of much of Mexico. Um, and what that meant for me as a young queer person was that it was also a culture that whether people were religious or not was ingrained in Catholicism. And that Catholicism creates this feeling, this underlying current that everybody knows that, in, at, especially when I was a kid, that if you're queer, if you're gay, if you're a lesbian, you should be ashamed of that identity. And it's something that's whispered about. It's not something that's open or celebrated or discussed in positive light. It's something that's wrong. And many people, um, I think, feel like they're, they're being a good person by, by like looking the other way or ignoring uh, gay or lesbian members of their family in this culture. But, but that's actually really damaging um, because it makes you grow up thinking that it's something that you have to keep hidden. And for me, going into STEM, this feeling that being queer was something that I needed to get to keep hidden really permeated my work life uh, and was reinforced later in ways that I'll, I'll talk about in just a moment. Um, this is me as a kid. And, and what I'll say is, is I think, you know, perhaps because of my queer identity, but certainly inspired as well by my parents who were huge nature lovers, nature was my solid companion. I was, I was like a, an extreme, what they called back then, a tomboy. Uh, I would say that I still am. And, and I loved just playing out in the dirt, getting muddy, finding creatures under rocks. Uh, and, and I carried that with me throughout my entire life because I knew that even when my peers thought I was strange or I felt excluded at school because of my personality, which was what I what I thought it was at the time, I, I had failed to recognize as a young child that I was that I was queer because that wasn't something that people talked about or that I knew was an option. But nature was there uh, and it was always accepting and always full of new surprises. So when I got to college uh, and I went to call, I stayed uh, at, at home for college. I went to my hometown university, the University of Texas at El Paso and um, I started to experience a really different world, a world where my identity, <laughs> sorry, the life of working from home in the midst of COVID, uh, barking dogs, crying kids, uh, and everyone noisier than you want them to be when you have to do something like record. Okay, so uh, when I got to college, I think, you know, I was suddenly immersed in this world of, of, science. I mean, I, I decided to major in biology because I knew I loved nature. Um, and, I, and I was taking biology classes and learning things and excited. Um, I went to a primarily Hispanic serving institution. So the majority of the student population of UTEP uh, his, is Hispanic. And so the experience that I had in university was probably unlike the typical university experience for people that attend universities that aren't uh, uh, minority serving or his, or HBCUs um, or tribal colleges and universities. I think for, for everyone else outside of those university settings, you're, if you're a minority, you're probably a minority um, rather than a majority. And so college, I think it's hard for me to reflect on my experience in terms of that identity, but but later when I got to graduate school, I, so I moved to New York for graduate school uh, and I suddenly was the minority in my classes. Uh, things changed, there was a shift. I felt overwhelmed. I felt like the language people used had too many syllables and I didn't understand, I wasn't used to speaking in that way. I mean, it wasn't to say that I didn't know what all the words meant, although probably I didn't know what some of them meant. Um, but I just came from a culture and a community where people use the simpler version of words rather than the more complex one. And so I started feeling out of place um, because of my intersectional identity, not, not, not only because of my queer identity. And I think that that 
that feeling of being out of place crept in more and more without me realizing it through time. Uh, in my lab at the American Museum of Natural History where I was a graduate student, I was, I was the only woman. Um, I was also the only queer person uh, in my lab or any other lab that I was aware of, uh, the only queer student. Uh, there were no queer curators at that natural history museum that I was aware of at the time. And so I felt like the most of my identity at the time needed to be kept hidden because it was going to make me different or othered or make allow other people to realize that maybe some mistake had been made when I was admitted because I didn't belong there in the first place. Uh, and so eventually I started doing some research about the experiences of people working, people studying in STEM as undergraduates. And what I found was reinforcing of the experience that I had ex of my own experience. Um, so first underrepresented minorities on US college campuses have a six year degree completion rate of that's half that of their Asian and white peers. So they're not finishing their degrees uh, at the same rates that Asian and white students are. Uh, women, regardless of socioeconomic background, perform worse than men in introductory STEM classes, regardless of their aptitude tests when applying for college. So they may have scored um, as good, if not better than the men in their, in their classes, but uh, are getting worse grades. First generation students also, regardless of, of socioeconomic or ethnic background, have the highest dropout rates of any student. And that's because they're not getting the support um, because of life experience at home that their peers have. I, I can remember for the first time when I was a graduate student meeting somebody, having a, a peer and having this realization that their parents were university faculty members and like what an experience that would be to have a person who had already gone through undergraduate and graduate school and successfully obtained a university faculty position, which is like really incredibly hard to do in the first place, to be able to advise them through this pathway and how to get there and how to reach their, their goal. Um, I'm a biologist. And so for me, one of the most shocking statistics relates to life sciences undergrads. So undergraduates that are studying fields like biology. And while Black, Latino, and Native Americans make up at least 30% of the US population, there's only, they only make up 17% of life sciences undergrads in, here in the US. And so they're not even getting through the gates. They're not even enrolling in life science majors in the first place. And so it's not surprising then when we don't see representation that's so important at the level of faculty. Um, never mind that there's a bunch of other reasons and concerns that many of those people that fall into this category or any of these categories really never make it to the faculty level. Um, we see a lack of, of retention of these students all along the entire uh, pathway from undergraduate or even from high school all the way through to, to, to obtaining a, a, a position, but they're not even starting. And that's, I think, really where the tragedy is. And for me, I, I really hope that just in talking about this and in, in making this uh, something that people are aware of in, in, the, in, in the first place, uh, will begin to, to slowly change this through time. So I just wanna talk for a minute about queer people and queer experiences, because this is really the subject of, of, of this talk but I thought that it was important to, to introduce those other statistics because we're all intersectional. And the more intersectional that we are, those intersectional identities just conflate and compound the hardships and difficulties that we face in making it, in making it in, in STEM and in making it in science and engineering and math and technology. So just a year ago, this was the map of places in the United States where being queer, being lesbian, gay, transgender, bisexual, was a protected class of employment. Meaning that if you lived in one of the states that's gray or probably light purple, you could show up to work, your boss could find out that you were gay, and you could be fired. And that was reasonable grounds for termination of your employment. 
So already we were excluded from a huge proportion of the workforce. And so it's not surprising then to learn that there are a number of things along the way that make it almost impossible for queer people to enter the STEM workforce and feel included. And this starts again back at the undergraduate campus. Uh, so these are statistics about queer and transgender students on US undergraduate campuses. And the first two are pertaining to just the general student body, which is that LGB students report the highest on-campus sexual assault and misconduct, meaning that they experience on-campus sexual assault and misconduct from their peers at a rate higher than any other student category. And 60% of trans and gender non-conforming students report incidences of sexual misconduct and harassment. So two thirds of all trans and non-binary students attending class in a place that should be safe are reporting incidences of sexual misconduct and harassment. So it is really already an uncomfortable place the moment you set foot in the door to be on a college campus as a queer person. For me, the statistic, and there's really not many, um, there are very few studies on the experiences of LGBTQ students in STEM uh, in particular, but of the one study that's been published uh, recently, there's a statistic that I think is, is a worrisome for me as a queer person in STEM, which is that for most people that are majoring in a STEM degree, if you participate in a research experience, like you have the opportunity to work in a lab on campus of a professor or um, a researcher and engage in research for the very first time, it's this wonderful experience where you realize that you can be a scientist. But for LGBT students, they're more likely than their cisgender heterosexual colleagues to participate in research on campus as an undergraduate, but less likely to stay in STEM. And so what that suggests is that they have these experiences and perhaps as a result of these experiences, as a direct result, they decide that they wanna switch majors into a non-science major. So what is happening in the lab, in the research space, in the workspace that's causing these students already at a very young place. And I, I would just add that these students are no less likely to major in STEM degrees in the first place. They're just more likely to leave after choosing that major. Uh, so I think to figure out what's happening in, in the student experience, we really have to turn to the experience of faculty. These are the people that are teaching. These are the people that are welcoming students into their labs. Um, and so what we know, again, there's not very much data. Uh, the federal government doesn't collect census data about LGBT people. Um, and the biggest, the, the primary way that we track uh, retention and success in, in the fields of science and the fields of STEM is through an annual survey administered by the National Science Foundation, which is a government agency. Uh, and they have never included questions about um, LGBT identity in their annual survey. So we, we're data deficient to be quite frank, um, but of the studies that have been done, they've been mostly survey studies where they send surveys out and people respond to the surveys. And what they found is about 40% of faculty members working in STEM fields are not out to their colleagues. They are still in the closet, which is approximately um, the same ratio of the broader US population as far as we're aware. Um, and of those people that are out, so the 60% that are out, nearly 70% of them report having been made to feel uncomfortable in their university department. So their closest colleagues, like the people that work right down the hall, have made them feel uncomfortable solely on the basis of their identity as LGBT people. And this actually transcends outside of, of uh, traditional academia, university settings, um, because there was a survey that was sent out by the American Chemical Society uh, to the members of the society. And this, these people work in all different industries. They work in private industries, they work in government industries, they work in university uh, settings. And 44% of the people that responded said that they'd also been made to feel excluded, intimidated, or harassed at work. And so this isn't something that's exclusive to university settings, to academia. Uh, it's something that exists everywhere. And 
I think that this, this study that was published by Mathis et al. in 2019 concluded that heteronormative assumptions frequently silence conversations about gender and sexuality in STEM workplaces. And I think that this really hits the nail on the head. Um, this is my experience. This has certainly been my experience. Um, which is that it just feels like a space where you're not allowed to talk about that. You're not allowed to talk about what your gender identity is or what your sexuality is and STEM workplaces because everybody assumes that you're, that you're heterosexual and cisgendered. And so it makes having conversations about things like a photo on your desk really, really difficult. Um, this, is a, this is a photo of my family at my younger son's graduation. Um, and it, it is a photo that most people would look at me and look at this photo and have a lot of questions. Uh, and they would either, one of two things will happen. Either I have to come out over and over and over again because people don't understand what they're looking at. They just simply can't wrap their heads around it. Or I have to explain and people feel like they're owed an explanation of my entire family history. How did I come to have two sons? How did I come to have them uh, as, at a relatively young age? Why do I have a grandson that's black? Th these are the kinds of questions that people feel entitled to ask as a result of, of, of seeing this photo and thinking that uh, I, all of their assumptions about me, their heteronormative assumptions about me uh, are suddenly incorrect. And um, even I, as a, I think a very queer presenting uh, person, um, am assumed to be heterosexual because that is the assumption in STEM workplaces. Uh, and this is something that, that is actually doesn't matter in what context. Um, if we think about the federal government here in the US, uh, what we can say is that there's a ton of bureaucracy. And that bureaucracy is in part put in place uh, internally to ensure equality. Um, but a, a study that was, that was done in 2017 found that despite these really expansive anti-discrimination policies and bureaucratized accountability structures that formally protect LGBT employees because federal LGBT employees were protected even though the federal government doesn't protect all workers um, up until recently. What they found was that these inequalities are pervasive in STEM agencies, in agents, federal government agencies that are focused on STEM. And they doesn't matter how old you are, it doesn't matter what your rank is, uh, it doesn't matter if you're if you identify as a man or as a woman. Um, there are there is inequality that occurs regardless of what uh, things they've tried to put in place to prevent this. Uh, and again, it, it extends across all disciplines. So uh, biology is, I think, very different from from the field of physics. Um, but the American Physical Society, probably uh, one of the most proactive societies in examining the climate for for LGBTQ people working in, in physics careers concluded that a heterosexist climate that reinforces gender role stereotypes in STEM workforces is in STEM work environments is what is preventing LGBTQ people from staying in physics uh, and or um, uh, 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 increasing in moving along the trajectory of their career. And this is problematic. It's problematic for queer people. It's problematic for women. Um, and it's problem. It's certainly problematic for people that are non-gender conforming, like transgender or non, or, or non-binary presenting uh, people. So, I, I took these experiences that I had. I took this research that I'd done about my own experience, having been the first queer person uh, work in the history of a 167-year-old institution in San Francisco. I took my research that I'd done on the experiences of undergraduates and and faculty. And I decided that I needed to do something. I needed to feel less alone. And in doing so, perhaps other people would feel less alone as well. And so I decided that I do what I do is start a visibility campaign. Uh, so I reached out to a, to a few colleagues, uh, both straight and, and queer colleagues, uh, students and, and faculty, um, allies and, 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 and queer identifying folks. And I told them about my idea and asked for help. And just a few months later, uh, in celebration of Pride in 2018, we launched 500 Queer Scientists with a collection of 50 stories of really brave people working and studying in STEM that were willing to share their identity, 
both as a queer person, but also as their science identity, as their STEM identity. So allowing these two things that for my entire life I'd kept separate in different rooms. I was outside of work a queer person and inside the work uh, just a scientist, not anything else. And I, was, and I didn't want to talk about it because it was weird and unusual and made me feel stigmatized. And I decided that it was, enough was enough. It was time for those things to live in the same space. And so I started this campaign with this really simple tweet. Um, it was uh, me declaring to the world who I was and why it was important that visibility for queer people exist in STEM workspaces. Uh, and so slowly our, 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 our um, campaign grew uh, and within, actually not very slowly, so within three weeks we went from 50 to 500 uh, contributions to, to our campaign. Uh, and we were maintaining uh, accounts on, on Twitter, we still are, on Instagram, and we have a website where people can contribute their own stories, 500queerscientists.com. Uh, and this was, this was sort of the starting 50, uh, this was the gallery, and, and this is really how this campaign works. It's first person stories, so they're short, they're 250 words, with a photo that allows people of, to have a visual representation of who they are and for other people to see that visual representation and feel a sense of solidarity, feel a sense of belonging, uh, feel a sense of community. And uh, we've continued to grow this, this campaign over time. We're now about two and a half years in. We've had over 1400 contributions of stories to our site. Um, we run a social community of about 20,000 uh, people and we have about 10,000 monthly web visitors that read the stories in our gallery. And I take this really seriously. I feel a really big sense of responsibility to ensure that these people are represented honestly, these people are represented accurately, uh, and, and these people are taken seriously as STEM professionals, as STEM students. And they are. Uh, we have people ranging from undergraduate students all the way to deans and directors of research facilities. Uh, we have people working in science policy. We have people that are educators. Um, we really have everything that I could have imagined and more. And what, it, what, what really it has turned out is that I was not alone in the way that I was feeling. Um, and if this, this campaign and this experience has taught me anything, it's that I am not alone and and others have, have felt the same way. Uh, and it's little messages like this um, that happen regularly that remind me that, um, which is that other people, this is an example of someone who had never um, met any, anybody that was queer in STEM until they got to grad school and still wondered if they, if they had a place here, which is, I think, echoes things that I had felt. Um, here's another great example that I really love of a, of a student saying that, that, that that they really idolize, or I don't know if idolize is the right world, but that they really are happy to be able to see uh, a role model that represents their own identity, um, public, publicly expressing their identity. And, the, and then the exact person that they're talking about um, responding to say that, that it's really only because of, of others having the courage to come out um, and be open about their identity that they were able to do so themselves. And so I think that that just really serves to reinforce the importance of building this community, the importance of building this visibility, and the importance of reassuring people that they have a space um, and that there is a place for them. And I just want to end, I, you know, I think so often when I, when I talk to, to, to groups about the importance of visibility in STEM, one of the questions people often have is how can they support? How can they be an ally? Because the reality is, is we shouldn't be doing all of this work. Um, we as the queer community shouldn't be the ones doing the work to feel included, to feel like we belong. And, and allies are really important and they can be extremely impactful. And this is, um, an example that I love to share because I think it really sums up what makes a good ally. It's somebody that affirms your identity. It's somebody that asks what they can do to help you instead of assuming what they can do. And it's somebody that reassures you that they are there and ready and willing to listen to any frustrations or concerns that you might have. 
Um, and finally, as a, as a person working in STEM, this email that was sent from a faculty member by a dean, I don't know either of them, but I love this example. It was a, a screenshot posted to Twitter early in our campaign. Um, it really, this email really also reaffirms that they're a good scientist and that they're there because of that attribute. And so um, I'll, I'll read this out for, for anybody that, that, that's having trouble reading the screen. Uh, and, and what it says is, Dear Aaron, I wanted to reach out to let you know that I saw you are publicly identifying as non-binary and to assure you that you have my support. I also wanted to check in on whether there are any changes you would like to me to make in the way that I or the team talks to you or refers to you, e.g. name or pronouns or anything else that would help affirm your identity. Finally, please know that you can come to me with any frustrations or concerns related to this or anything else. You're a great scientist and I'm proud to have you on the team. Regards, Nigel. And I think when you when you talk about how to be a good ally, like this email ha ticks all the boxes. It's affirming, it's open to, to input or correction, and it's asking what they can do. Uh, and so, so uh, for anyone out there looking, looking for tips on, on how to be a good ally, there, there's tons of resources. Um, the Human Rights Campaign publishes a, a whole list of resources on allyship, uh, along with a, a billion other uh, online uh, uh, sources. And, and so I, I just wanna say thank you so much for listening. Um, I really appreciate you uh, hearing what I have to say about, about visibility and the importance of visibility and intersectionality uh, for queer people in STEM. Uh, and uh, I hope you have a, a, a great uh, rest of your day.
spiders. Ah! Thank you so much, Dr. Esposito, for all of your work to increase the visibility of queer scientists around the world to help them find their community. Now, we will take a short break and be back with our very first panel to discuss the adversities faced by Black queer scientists in STEM. See you soon.
Hey everyone, welcome back from break. And now it is time for our very first panel on the adversities faced being black and queer in STEM. Our participants in the panel are Samantha Mensa, a material science PhD student at the University of California in Los Angeles. Melanie McReynolds, PhD, HHMI, Hannah Gray, postdoctoral fellow, Princeton University. Annaner Hinton, PhD, postdoctoral Ford fellow, University of Iowa. And Nicole Del Castillo, MD, MPH, Director of the Office of Diversity, Inclusion and Equity at the University of Iowa. Hello, I am Nicole Del Castillo, and I'm the Director of the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Carver College of Medicine at the University of Iowa. And I have the pleasure of moderating this panel today, Adversities Faced Being Black and Queer in STEM. So our first panelist is Dr. Antonor Hinton. Hi, uh, my name is Dr. Antonor Akarel Hinton Jr. I'm at the University of Iowa. I'm a postdoc fellow. I'm a Bureau's Welcome Fund E. Justin Ford Foundation fellow. And I also am a postdoc at Mayo Clinic where I'm at currently. And I'm a rising assistant professor at Vanderbilt University in the Department of Molecular Physiology and Biophysics and also in the Diabetes Center as well. Nice to meet you, everyone, and I uh, look forward to this conversation. Thank you. Our next panelist is Sammy Mensa. Hi, everyone. My name is Sammy Mensa. I am a PhD candidate at UCLA studying materials chemistry, um, and I'm really excited to be here today. Thank you. And next, we have Dr. Melanie McReynolds. Yeah, good morning, everyone. I'm Melanie McReynolds. I'm currently a postdoctoral fellow at Princeton University, where I'm a HHMI Hannah Gray Fellow and Burroughs Welcome Fund PDEP awardee and a rising assistant professor at a location to be determined soon. Great. So we'll just start with our question. So first question is, what does intersectionality mean to you? I can go ahead and answer this one first, if that's okay. Yes. Um, for me, intersectionality is really the intersection between all of my different identities, um, being being Black, Hispanic, um, Latina, um, queer, and a scientist. All of these things are different parts of, of who I am, and they, they um, sum up to a... A uh, significant sort of um, combination, a unique combination of experiences that contribute to how I do my science and the way I look at the world. Intersectionality for me is more of my personal story. It's the makeup of who I am, the essence of who I am, and how I share myself with the world. Um, Yeah, it's a piggyback off of everyone else. Um, intersectionality for me as well is like, you know, who not only just like, you know, the various identities and where they connect and disconnect, but also who um, who I am and my personal story and who it makes me. But more so, I think intersectionality also comes into a place of your experience and also your exposures, depending on what you've been, you know, you've been exposed to can also influence your um, intersectionality. Like for me, I'm a black woman, but I'm also a Mississippi woman. So with, you know, there's a Southern aspect or where I could be people, what does that mean? You really can't place a person who's fluid inside of a box. I'm a believer. So how can believer be fluid on top of being a scientist? So there are a lot of dynamics, but I think that's the beautiful part of being, you know, of intersectionality to where, you know, we have various um, identities where it comes to our race, our creed, our nationality, where we from, how did we grow up, our caste system, our educational system, and really like, you know, how far have your horizons been exposed or expanded in life? That's my view of intersectionality. Thank you. And that, that leads me to my next question. How has your intersection, intersectionality affected your academic path? 
I think for me, I was one of those kids who was always outside of the box and loved to explore and question because, you know, me being a black woman from the deep south, I've always um, or that's a queer black woman. from. I mean, you know, we you have so many questions about life and everything else in between. So being a scientist really gives you that freedom to explore and to discover and just to really expand and go outside of the box. So to me, um, where I am and who I am is perfect as being a scientist. And it really just gives me the ability to just flow and create and do whatever I want to do when I want to do it. Great. AJ or um, Melanie, do you guys want to, or Sammy, do you want to share anything else? Um, can you repeat the question again? Sure. Yeah. The question is, um, how has intersectionality affected your academic path? Okay. Um, yeah, so it definitely has affected my academic path. When I when I think about my mentors and the people who I look up to that look like me, who were able to impart a sense of um, a sense of sort of seeking scientific, you know, betterness than, than scientific improvements. Um, these are people whose intersectionalities aligned with my own, and they also sometimes didn't align with my own, and I think that that definitely Im, Im, imparts a sense of, like, um, community in terms of developing a scientific community, if that makes sense. <laughs> So for me, um, I think of it kind of in a different way. I guess I didn't really appreciate my intersectionality to more of the years when I got into my late post, uh, started to my late graduate and early postdoc years. So I guess before then, I guess I used my intersectionality more as a creative flow or juice to be able to empower me. Um, but then when I felt more confident in all of my story, then it allowed me to feel more of what I was and who I am still today. And so for me, I think of intersectionality as a as like almost like a, a birth inside of a birth, if you will. So it's kind of like unlocking the potential that's inside of you. And when you can appreciate your story and your personal journey, then you really can unlock your potential and start to really grow and shine. And you also connect to other people that can sharpen you as well. Um, I've met a lot of people along the way, like Dr. Mitt Reynolds, who's sharpened me to be better. Um, and so it's really nice to be able to um, share space with other individuals that are like-minded, that, you know, can, can improve you. And so I think it has an aspect of community. It's one thing. So when you're able to appreciate who you are, people will gravitate to you and you'll be able to gravitate to them and sharpen them. Um, on a daily basis, and it becomes a beautiful thing. Um, and so that also lands itself for science to be able to do the same thing, connect, collaborate, um, to share ideas, um, to share your creativity. And then also what's beautiful is that you can attract people that look like you um, to be able to have a safe zone as well. Thank you. So next is uh, somewhat of a two-part question. Um, so have you felt isolated or have, ha have you had feelings of imposter syndrome, like you don't belong um, because of your intersectional intersectionality in either your personal or professional life? Um, has and, and, and because of this, um, or related to these situations, have there been um, instances where you've overcome these feelings of imposter syndrome or isolation? I can start off and I'll try not to ramble. I would say um, I kind of similar to what AJ was going where, you know, later grad school, early later postdoc, you really begin, you know, accepting yourself. And I think it's where we are now too, right? Where it's so, you know, it's okay to be outside of the box. You know, a lot of people have a story, you know, no one, um, 
you know, it's, everyone has um, a various story. So in the beginning of time, it could have been a moment where I probably could have hid who I really was or really was very secretive. So no one really knew, you know, I didn't even know, you know, so a lot of times you keep that to yourself, but what kind of, you know, how is that being beneficial? But something else AJ said too, like when you are this type of person, you identify people who are like you and it builds community and it really builds strong friendships and foundations. So in that said, we know what that said in graduate school, when you're going through this journey, you will, um, find other people. You will relate and you will support and you will build. You will have um, a secret life amongst your friends. And those are your, com you know, your um, colleagues and your friends who you get through the graduate process with. So, you know, with that said, you know, it could be, it could be been in some people's eyes, it could be, you know, negative and other people, you know, it could have been very supportive, but that's, without rambling too much. I don't know if I answered the question, but you know, when you, when you identify with people who are similar to you, who are, you know, going through, we're all been through the graduate um, or the medical school process. So we know how hard and how tough it is, but to just, you know, for me to have, you know, a gay best friend, a male, you know, a, if I can have me a good queen that I can go through that process with, we understand each other. And, you know, when I have that person, I'm happy. Um, and we get each other, we support each other. So where, you know, my advisors or anyone, else it doesn't matter to me if they understand who I am because my network and my support system gets me thank you any other thoughts um I definitely have struggled with feelings of isolation and imposter syndrome um when I came to UCLA even on my undergrad I struggled with that um but at UCLA especially um you know I didn't come from the most renowned undergrad institution, and it wasn't. It's not. Re it wasn't renowned for research or, or for teaching. And UCLA is renowned for both. And so I was like, how am I supposed to come from an from a different institution and teach at the level that they expect me to when I don't know if I've had the proper background and I'm just worried whether I'm at the same level as everybody else. But when I came here, I found that there really is a support system of graduate students there to support each other. And um, even though that does exist, that along with my mentors and my network have been, um, have been pivotal in terms of being able to overcome imposter syndrome. Um, I'm still struggling with it now though. And I think that if anybody else has any more advice on how to sort of, um, get over that hump. I would be happy to take it. So for me, I feel like I wasn't able to really um, assert myself in science because I didn't have the confidence to, and that had to deal with my imposter syndrome, and I still have imposter syndrome today. Um, sometimes, I guess, the opposite approach for me is that I already know that I have imposter syndrome and I'm going to deal with it. But the way that I deal with it is by trying to be successful so that eventually I can overcome it with confidence. But until that day kind of really happens, I just try to use all of my creativity to be able to, you know, just drive great ideas and just channel everything and believe and trust in God that, you know, that one day I'll be able to overcome it. And then I also try to find ways to cope with it because I feel like it's going to be there for a while because with my intersectionality, there's so many other things that happen in the world that impact my imposter syndrome, whether it's micro or macroaggressions daily that come up all the time where people are like, oh, are you supposed to be here? You know, or, you know, are you, why are you, why are you here? You know, I even had that happen, uh, you know, when I was up here, you know, traveling to actually do some some structures, you know, someone was asking, you know, oh, wow, you know, you're here and, you know, it, and you can tell. And so I feel like it's constant bombardment of things happening daily. So sometimes even when you work out imposter syndrome for the day, you have to pick back up and start back over because each day is a new trial. And sometimes even, you know, it's not even a trial, it becomes a tribulation to be perfectly honest. So to be honest about how to deal with it, if you take it day by day, and you actually sometimes have to get some confidence boosters. <laughs> but your friends, you're like, hey, is everything okay? You're like, oh, you know, I need, like, you know, I need someone to talk to so you can get through that day. So really you need to have a support network with your friends 
and colleagues too, because sometimes your friends won't exactly understand what's going on, but you're comfortable because they're going through the same thing. So you have to be able to get both and know how to use both. So that means you need mindfulness in the context of like meditation to be able to overcome it every day. You have to visualize who you are and believe that you can be excellent. Can I say one more thing about imposter syndrome? Um, especially when Sammy asked for that. Um, I think it was 2015, maybe my fourth year in graduate school, when I first read about imposter syndrome. Marion um, sure, rest in peace, she was a professor at UNC San Diego, a black woman there. Um, she was she she wrote a lot in ASB and B, and she wrote about various struggles. And one of the first writings that I read from her um, was about imposter syndrome and being a black woman biochemist in the academy. And I was like, wow, wait a minute, this is a real thing. This is what I experience, you know, every day. So I think for me, realizing that everybody and their mama deal with it, right? It's nothing the new under the sun, you know, we all, you know, so when I realized that even the people who were in the room that were making me feel like an imposter, they're making me feel like an imposter because they are an imposter. I began to have a whole different look and an outlook on it. And kind of like, you know, AJ said, slowly but surely your confidence, when you become your full, not saying you're not your full self, but for me, when I became my full self, Within my science, the confidence came with it. And at the end, you really just got to let the work you do speak for you. And you can't really live for the satisfaction of others, but you really got to live for the fulfillment of yourself. Like your science is your science. No one can tell you who you are, what you can do, but you can bring your authentic self into your science and no one else can ever do it like you. And having that mentality, it kind of, nothing heal. I mean, you can try to heal it. Nothing really gets over imposter syndrome because someone's going to challenge you anytime they get a chance, but it helps you to combat it and deal with it, or in some cases, ignore. But yeah. Thank you all. So do you think there is a, a synergistic effect being both Black and queer in STEM or in your personal life? I can repeat the question. Yeah. Question. <laughs> yeah, I can repeat the question. Do you think there is a synergistic effect being both black and queer in STEM or in your personal life? Personal life? Yes. I'll go ahead, Dr. Let me go first. It's okay. Sorry. No, I just, <laughs> I think it goes back to the, you know, intersectionality question too, right? So, um, I mean, if it's synerg synergistic, it's beneficial. Um, and I think it's just who I am. Um, I'm at a space now, um, 33 years of age, turning 34 soon, I'm just going to be authentically me and just bring my full self into every single space um, and not, you know, give any excuses or disclaimers about it. And I think in that case, it works for me now, you know, just be who you are, let your light shine. And yeah, I guess that, <laughs> I don't, I don't believe I'm answering these questions, <laughs> but I, that's all I can say. You are, and you're killing it. Don't, mm, no, ma'am, you're killing it. You're killing it. Um, I just wanted to say, like, the piggyback off of her, I think it is about walking into who you are in order to be able to bring your blackness and your queerness. And, you know, to be perfectly honest, you know, I, I am, you know, black. So I just want to say, you know, I think some of the things that my queerness is, is from black culture. So for me, it's kind of a natural, you know, um, observation. I guess I'll give you an example. Like, for example, like if, if you know, like if I was, um, at a ball, right? And you read in the room, it's that, are you reading somebody, you know, at the bar, the club? It's the same for science, right? When you read the room for science, yes. Exactly. Yeah. So you're like, mm, I'm at the seminar. Ooh, he think you're doing something. Then he get up there and he's doing something. You be like, now you know, this was not no good science. Or when someone throws down. shade and you, the yes. academic shade and it's like, you catch it. It's like, okay, I see what kind of mood you're in today. Yeah. Exactly. And it's the same thing, you know, you have to know how to read the room and be able to throw shade back. And the way that scientists throw shade is you have to know your literature. So you can let somebody kind of come for you, and then all of a sudden you feel like, that's a good point. However, in this paper, and you wait for their response, you give them that look, honey, that's the same thing as being queer or black, honey. You read the room and you throw back the shade and, and you 
serve them. And you don't let them serve you. Because that, that's the name of the game. And really, your science is how you are in drag. So basically, you neck it until you present or you let someone know from publishing what you're doing. So the more publishing that you have, the more drag that you have, the more changes that you can make. And so that's why you read the literature. That is why you come out fierce every day. And you have to work the room. And then sometimes with imposter syndrome, you have to smile. It's like how Tyra Banks says, you have to be able to smile with your eyes. You can't let people know what's going on, really. So really, sometimes you have to do a, a flip. You have to read yourself to know how you look in the morning. You do a post check and then you just you run with it. So I think that my queerness and my blackness are one and the same. And, you know, although I'm black before I'm queer because I wake up in the skin color and not, you know, and some people don't even know, you know, that I identify as queer until I tell them or until I'm really excited about something and be like, oh, yes, honey. You know, so that, you know, that's something that, you know, kind of comes with it. So, you know, you have to be able to just wake up and just incorporate. You just go with the flow of things. And that is what it's like being black. And it's the one and the same with being queer because you're marginalized. And when I mean you are marginalized, I feel like being black is the bottom of being marginalized. Um, you know, then there's some subcategories to what we do for ourselves in the form of colorism. And then also how we separate, um, you know, identity, how we separate sexuality in the black community. So there's a lot of very deep things that, um, you know, we as a people have to come together. We don't, we're not going to be able to really battle things. We don't have to like each other, but we have to learn how to live with each other. And we have to celebrate each other's differences. Um, yeah, I don't know, this is good now. I see you. I was like, and one thing to sum up kind of what AJ was saying in the beginning where I was going, when when I think for me, my black and my queerness, ever since 2009, when I started my Bridges journey and watching like, you know, RuPaul, I realized in science, we got to we have to bring our uniqueness, our charisma, our nerve and our talent every day in science. And when we do that, just the same thing you do in drag, we do it in science. And that's how we shine. That's how our light shine. And that's the reason why Blacks, especially right now, so many people are intrigued with Black scientists. How did you all make it? What kind of science are you doing? Oh my God, you all are all so amazing. A decade ago, no one was checking for me, but I showed up every day, right? With my uniqueness, my charisma, my nerve, and my talent. And that's what we have to have. And that's the mindset. So we are naked until we clothe ourselves. Self. And we, when we show up on that stage, you got to perform, giving a talk, giving a seminar, even critiquing a paper in a journal club. Like AJ said, they're going to come for you on that literature. How would you come for them back? All right, Sammy, it's yours. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that you guys perfectly summed up everything that I wanted to say, basically. Um, <clears throat> um, I didn't have too much to add, but... Overall, I do think that there's a synergistic effect just because I don't know, I don't think I'd be on the same path that I am today if I wasn't my full self whenever the moment called for me to be my full self. So I can see that definitely it has brought me to where I am today. So I got a question back to you. What about Black and Afro-Latina? You know, that's a thing. So the Afro-Latina, can you speak? From that perspective, because a lot of people don't realize that you can be Black, Latin, X, and then also queer. So can you talk about that? Because that is a whole nother level of intersectionality that we don't even talk about that much. Yeah, no, it's crazy because um, um, there's colorism in the Black community, but there's also colorism in the Latina community. And there's a lot of Latinos who believe that they, who are Black, who don't think, who don't believe that they're Black just because of the fact that there's been so much um disparaging of that side of themselves and it and it's rampant in the latina community i also see it in the black community um and i feel like my intersectionality is sort of bringing to light someone that hasn't been put in the spotlight that often which is afro latinx people and um yeah we're out here we exist <laughs> Thank you all. So now I'm going to switch a little bit and talk a little bit about um, 
health inequities and um, some research questions. So um, what are the health inequities that black queer people um, face? I can just start. Um, I will be quick and simple. I think, you know, stress is the root of all disease and all illnesses, right? So from a young age, say if you have a Black queer child who is, you know, they know they're queer, they know that their family may not be accepting, they may have internal stress of what would happen when my family find out, what would happen, you know, what would happen in my community. And that stress just builds and stress leads to all types of metabolic diseases and syndromes. So you may have a 25 year old diagnosed with diabetes and it's perfectly healthy, but they've been having internal stress for the last 15 years of their life. You know, right. You may have, uh, there. So I, I would just say, you know, we are not supposed to stress and worry, but that, is a burden sometimes people don't know how to carry and it's so taboo so people don't really talk about it either so stress is the foundation for all diseases and I think that's my answer to that as a psychiatrist I appreciate that <laughs> <laughs> I, I really like your answer uh, so the reason being is because one thing that I think the black community does well is resilience. And unfortunately, we a lot of times have to deal with the stress that no one talks about. So hundred percent that I think stress can produce disease. We can change state of cells, change state of mitochondrial metabolism, and with mitochondrial metabolism altered everything not just changes. So the flux changes as you would say. Um, and so the thing about this is honestly that there are other health inequities as well that we don't talk about. And one is education. So how to properly educate our community on what the health trends are that are currently happening and what are the ones that we personally deal with as a community, I think is the big thing that we need to do. Secondly, I also believe that um, we're not dealing with the current things that are going on very well. A lot of us that are queer, are not really listening to the media per se because they don't even have a voice. We don't even have a voice in the media. So a lot of people that are dying because they're queer or trans, they're never talk, they're never discussed or silenced. And so a lot of times we have a we have a you know a misconception of what the media is saying. And so with COVID coming up, we may not be receiving the right information within our communities because we're more worried about other things, more about celebrating who we are, uh, uh, you know, just being noticed. Um, sometimes uh, it's counterintuitive because information and how it flows really matters. And then another one is HIV. I think that there's still a stigma with that. And I also think that we have to be able to get regularly tested. And in our community, we don't do the taboo with going to the doctor. And I think it's very important to have conversations with your partner or partners if you're polyamorous and um, you know, be aware of what goes on um, and have an open dialogue. And I think communication is also a sickness as well. We ourselves as the black community, you know, at whole and also the queer and trans community, we don't talk about how to educate ourselves the proper way. So if we don't have the proper communication just to communicate amongst ourselves. How can we communicate with health professionals? So I think these are areas that are not unique, but go along with stress. And they're up under stress, too, because stress causes why we're not able to do these other things. So I really think that Dr. Reynolds is on the end of stress, and that is the key driver because everything exacerbates because of that stress. And I really think that we need to learn how to work with the church um, and talk to parents, talk to the community officials to be able to make a safe place because we don't have a safe place. If the black community is not safe, there's no other place that's going to be safe. Um, you know, it's the epicenter, I believe, of, you know, culture and tradition and love and values, but we have to be able to show all that at the same time. So again, I think that also boils down to inside of communication. I do believe there's a sickness when you're unique and when you bring your intersectionality. So I'm trying to say that they challenge themselves first so that they can be themselves instead of people on what's inside of you. Identify your stressors are the things that could manipulate your situation or how you talk to somebody or how you do things or how you love someone. Um, so I think that this is the big epidemic that's going on in our community and the stress in addition to the other things that are communicating as well. Um, 
Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I think there are definite health disparities for the African American community. I don't know who knows this, but Black people are more likely to die from basically everything at higher rates than the white counterparts. That includes heart heart disease, um, uh, birth, like the um, more mortality during birth, uh, stroke, um, and things like that, and other diseases. And that's across the board, like every every single tick. And it's like there's this cycle where as AJ was mentioning the education isn't there that um, leads to more prosperous outcomes. But, and, and so since the education's not there, the, we, we don't have the doctors there to actually, um, <clears throat> to actually disseminate important information to the black community. Um, and again, that just creates the, makes the problem even worse. So it's like this vicious cycle. Um, and so for me, I, I think that I'm, I'm not sure I, I'm, I'm aware of these health disparities, but I'm just not sure how to address them. Like, I, I think that science communication is going to be a huge part of it. Having black educators and blacks and black um, doctors is going to be a huge part. But other than that, I think that we need to really put our minds together and think about some more ways we can address these health disparities because it's, it's a it's a public health issue for sure. How do we get to the root, right? And when we think about, like you mentioned, those cycles, generational curses, stress. If stress, what if stress, you know, like epigenetics, right? It could be passed down from generation to generation. So all of the burdens of my ancestors are falling on me. Not only are we resilient where we can push through everything, but how is our bodies and our, you know, how is everything else changing? And with this diet and with all of the um, pollutants in the air, et cetera. How could that be causing us to die from heart disease at the age of 34? It's unreal, right? But it's happening. Or every time we go into birth, you're going, you know, is will my baby survive? Will I survive? Will both of us survive? You know, it's a fear now of being a black woman giving birth. You may lose your life. And I think you, you all hit on a lot of the health inequities as well as um, kind of, I think, inadvertently as well, like the health care inequities that people, you know, access to care um, and barriers to getting care, adequate care. So to transition a little bit or to follow up actually on the questions or the responses that you all just gave, um, as you know, the COVID-19 virus will be coming out soon. And um, how, what are your thoughts about how to how we can ease mistrust um, towards the COVID-19 virus, or even just speaking about some of the issues behind why there is this mistrust, especially within the Black community? So in the meantime, I think that we're going to have to use the public to be able to disseminate information more carefully. One thing is actually using science twitter i really like raven and vision some of her songs are obviously just like amazing you wouldn't kind of put it together like you can talk about science in such a clever way but she does it such in a sophisticated way that people catch on and i watched recently one of her videos um and uh she was body <laughs> and it was uh the song and it was really, really good and what she did was she educated people about antibodies and COVID and vaccination. And so these are important topics, but she was doing it in a way that was clever, that was catching on. So using the culture, not against people, but celebrating it in a way that is affirming what's out there in science. And then also, I think that we're going to have to start having public opinion. So I really believe that the government may need to actually contact like Cardi B. For example, she got over almost 100,000 likes on her purse that she was talking about the other day about what she's going to use this, um, you know, what she's going to use this particular um, like uh, money to buy a purse. And so she actually decided not to. Um, but it generated so much of a buzz that people were thinking about how could they donate. And she was like, well, I'll match the donation. Um, so basically, in other words, instead of matching the donation this time, we can match her voice. So we actually have to ask people within the community that we see as our people of interest and people that we look up to, um, 
and then that way you can go ahead and um, you know focus and push forward to the next challenge. So I think that's what we're going to have to do. Yeah, and I'll piggyback and agree with both of those. We got to, um, how do we bring together the public interest and also the scientists, right? Um, and there are a lot of Black and STEM, a lot of Black scientists now. And I look at I look at scientists just as I look at the black athletes, just as I look at the black entertainers. Like, I don't see myself any different. Like, when I'm in the lab, that's equivalent to someone else being in the studio, right? Um, or someone else being in the gym. Like, you wasn't with me pipetting in the lab, just like I wasn't with you shooting in the gym. So, but when all of us understand that and you bring in dialogue and a conversation, you can begin to say, like, hey, you can actually trust this science. Like you have a black woman leading the, re like Kismika is leading this. Just like I've been studying NAD metabolism for the last decade. She's been studying coronaviruses for the last decade. And I don't think someone who looks like you would lead you wrong, but there's so much distrust. And the thing is, like, you know, I'm like, representation matters. It's important for not only people who look like me to do this type of science, but to also ask the questions that matter most to our communities and to protect our communities. We have your interests. Like, we're here. We, you know, we grew up learning about the Tuskegee Airmen. We go into science and say, hey, I'm going to make sure this never happens again. You have to trust that there are people in place who got your back, right? But it, it really calls for a conversation and alignment of that public interest. Interest. How can we bring people from all of these spaces together where, you know, people of the world will listen to and we can talk and we can dialogue and we can build trust around, you know, not just vaccines, but trust around science and medicine in general. Because it goes back to Sammy's point with, you know, the disparities. We got to get to the root and to move forward into the 21st century and to go for, you know, living in this world, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta, you know, make things a little bit better to all be on one accord and to bring healing. Sammy, did you want to add anything else or? I think they basically covered everything, so. Okay. So to follow up on that, um, you know, as you mentioned, mistrust is one of the issues within the Black community as it relates to the COVID-19 vaccine, as well as uh, the potential lack of um, Blacks represented in the trials. Um, any thoughts about um, increasing representation or more diverse representation when it relates to research? So there's one thing that I believe is more important than anything is educating the next generation. And so I believe STEM education outreach is imperative. I believe that you have to do it now. So it's called e-learning. That's something that we're doing now. Um, Dr. Melanie Reynolds and I are doing some science outreach and science communication. Um, and even policy change that we didn't, you know, inadvertently were doing, but we didn't realize that we were just doing what we do best. But one thing that I'm trying to say here is that we have to focus on the next generation now, and it's going to take scientists like us to be able to create intersectionality where there's not been before. Because there's so much focus on getting out of the hood by doing sports. There are other people that get out of the hood by doing other things. Um, and so I, my, one of my examples was my aunt before she passed away, was that she was the first to get out of the hood and get a degree and then come back and do things. And she worked for Shell before she had died. And so, and she also happened to be queer, um, which was not something that she talked about a lot, but she, it, it was who she lived. And, you know, and who she was. And so I had a really good representation. She kind of got me to really open up and be who I wanted to be. But the point of this is that um, if I didn't have a role model, if I didn't have someone that looked like me early on trying to, and, and, you know, change me to open my eyes to all possibilities instead of being closed-minded to focusing on one thing, I at first wanted to be like a nurse and then a doctor. But then I realized I could use my mind to actually answer questions. That, for me, was amazing. Um, and it kept generating more and more and more. And it wasn't until I got into plants when I was gardening with my grandfather. And I had no clue that plants could be science. And so there's a lot of things that we have to really think about how we talk about things in our community and how we're aware of things. And so it's going to take science groups like all of us on the phone and healthcare professionals to go back to the community constantly. Do not avoid 
going back just because the community doesn't look good. Do not avoid trying to pump money back into the community. Um, I'm moving closer to home to be able to help them. Um, so, you know, it, it's important. It's important that you take care of your community regardless of what's going on. You always have to believe in your community and you have to have belief in yourself to be able to do that. Um, when it comes to addressing some of these disparities, <clears throat> I think it's important to take a historical look at what has happened so far in terms of um, the disparities. So historically, women have also been excluded from specific um, uh, clinical trials, as well as drug testing. Um, female mice were excluded, were, were, were more studied than male, were less studied than male mice in terms of the drug initial drug tests and things like that, and um, so, but what uh, what was done to address these disparities was that the government stepped in and was like, okay, we're going to start funding research that um, that affects both sides. That that research is okay. How is this affecting the, the African American community? How is it affecting women? How is this is this going to impart differences in their lives? And so, um, and so I think that definitely more funding for research that, um, that addresses the disparities as well as figures out why, um, not only figure, figures out why it's there, but addresses them, um, is going to be important. Um, just how it was important in terms of getting women more involved into the sciences. Yeah, and I would just sum up everything, too, by saying definitely um, educating the next generation, um, science education, and also being at the right place at the right time. So what I say, like, yeah, you need to make sure you include X amount of, you know, marginalized people in your clinical trials. You have these companies that are not right going into the middle of these communities, giving drugs that are going to be detrimental. But a way around that would be making sure that you have people who look like us in positions where they're directing and overseeing clinical trials. You, so you can get the right amount of um, Black, Latinx, you know, Asian, white, male, females, transgender, you know, et cetera. And when, you know, going through these clinical trials and while now we're as scientists, a lot of us are asking questions that matter to our community, you know, so why is it a higher rate of, you know, elderly African-American women and men getting multiple myeloma? Um, and not other races, or what's going on with sickle cell anemia, like what is going on with these blood diseases? And now you have people who are focusing on these subset areas. And when we're educating in the next generation, it may not be myself, it may not be Sammy, it may not be AJ, but it may not, it may be one of our students, right, that have the discovery, maybe one of our mentees who get the Nobel Prize of these great, you know, it may be the people we train in the next generation. So how do we fix the world moving forward? It's a shit show now. But we can, you know, we can begin, you know, educating, mentoring, and healing, you know, writing those, writing the books, writing the rules, writing like, all right, this is how you include everyone. I feel like, you know, this is the beginning of a new renaissance. Right. So we are in charge to really write, you know, the next hundred years of how the world should go. Great. Um, thank you. And I know you all have touched on this a lot, but any, you know, um, additional thoughts about the importance of connecting science to the community? I think for everything we've been talking about, the mistrust. Um, there's so much public mistrust right now, or people don't even realize that it's people just like them doing science. And then when people who know us, um, Sammy and AJ may have a interesting story too, similar, people don't even know what we're doing. They think we're just in school and, or, you know, they don't realize what type of doctor you are or what are, you know, are you just following a protocol, you know, a book of experiments? Like what are, you know, so they have no idea what we're doing but um really you know that's you know scientists we have to come outside of our holes we got to come outside of our labs come outside of our bubbles where we're arguing with each other and really begin to communicate 
communicate and articulate what we're doing to build that public trust, to build like, you know, um, the citizens are, you know, giving their tax dollars to us. They should be excited to throw me their money. Right. You know, I will, you know, and that's the type of, you know, that's where we need to go in the next decade or so to really begin to build um, public trust and really be authentic, authentically who we are. So that, you know, the, little kids can see that you can be a strong woman of faith. You can be a little queer and you can be scientists and black and do it all. I concur with that. And I also wanted to say that we also have to learn how to be open-minded. A lot of times it's how we raise kids in our household and how we were raised. So there's some traditional values that are tradition and sometimes they have to be down in order to understand. For example, if I'm a doctor, a lot of people think I'm a medical doctor. And you know, the black community a lot of times like, oh baby, it's so good. How's the hospital going? So if I tell them I'm at Mayo Clinic, they think I'm seeing patients and not like doing 3D reconstruction and working, you know, um, a giant microscope and reconstructing images together. They don't think that. They're like, oh, how are the patients? <laughs> okay, you know, what do you do for COVID? Like I've had so many people in my family and, and the, you know, different various black communities um, contact me and ask, you know, well, how, how can we protect ourselves from COVID? So I have to constantly educate myself on uh, what's the, you know, the, the most the newest information that's reliable um, and that is the truth that stands on, you know, scientific knowledge. And I have to disseminate that as if I'm a medical doctor, I'm not. But I have to in order for my community to be okay. So we have these like dual roles that we are going to have to learn how to operate in. So I agree with what Melanie's saying in the context that we're just going to have to learn how to do it. We have to open up ourselves and really do it. Um, so that's what we need to really focus on. Um, and in order to be able to do that, we're also going to have to work with other people. So that means that we can't just work with individuals that are look like ourselves. We're going to have to work across the diaspora. So that means working with people that are Afro-Latino, people that are just Latino, people that are, you know, Asian, and a various background. And we're going to have to deal with the wounds that are within our communities separately and then across the minority communities in order to be able to come together to have a better goal. And lastly, I think the most important thing for trust is that we actually have to pay back what was taken from us. That starts with Henrietta Locks, right? You know, Hila cells are the largest, you know, cell line that's making so much money, millions and millions of dollars. And her family has not seen any of that money. Um, you know, maybe they just started a little bit together. They have made a monument and made a book in her name, but that doesn't do anything for the pain that's, you know, that's been caused. And any other time that there's been pain caused in the court system, there's court, you know, there's money given. So that's one of the myriad of different examples that could be done to actually start repairing some of the damage. Um, money is the golden standard these days. It's not gold right now, even though it's back with gold, but you have to put your money where your mouth is at. And so action creates action and actually reestablishes trust. And so that's something that has to be done. Um, and then, you know, not sticking people on reservations where, you know, they don't have any water or access to health care or not willing to continue to interact with the community that's, you know, maybe, you know, very close. That's the same thing that can be done in the queer community. And that's something that we have to actively be aware of. Um, so we have to have these conversations no matter how tough they are. We have to sit there and be uncomfortable. It's tired of stop being comfortable. I think one thing that I found with this presidency that was very interesting was I was very uncomfortable. And um, in my uncomfortableness, I have to use my gifts to be able to do something powerful. So coming together, like with um, Dr. Melanie Reynolds, we made the community of scholars to be able to start disseminating why minority scientists should be talked as, not only um, thought of as you know scientists, but talked as scientists. And what I mean by that is, you actually have to talk about other scientists and what they're doing. You have to know the research in addition to the DEI work. You have to be able to realize that we're scientists just like anyone else. Just because of the color of skin does not mean that we don't have brilliant ideas too. And so that's the same thing with what happens in the regular school system as well. We have to start treating students of color as people, as regular people that could be doctors, not just janitors, but people that can own businesses. If they want to be a janitor, let them own a business. Tell them about that propel them forward, stop pushing them back. And so that is, you know, a lot of the misconception. 
it also has to be an intersectionality between races, meaning that it has to be an intersectionality between stock and discrimination in order for trust to be reestablished. Any additional thoughts, Sammy? Um, besides more funding for the programs that I mentioned earlier, I think that there should also be more funding for, for science communicators <clears throat> to, um, to train science communicators and, in in addressing the public and being able to talk to the public. Um, I think that's going to be huge in terms of, uh, our ability to communicate with, um, with the audience. Thank you. Have you experienced racism and your homophobia slash transphobia in your scientific journey? I think, you know, I face aggressions. You know, what we say is blatant racism. Maybe, maybe not. You never know what a person may be feeling. But I definitely have experienced the world of um, microaggressions and macroaggressions. Um, I was... One time we was play, uh, it was 2015, 2016, a lot of deaths in the black community. So I went to have a celebration of Black Lives event. Um, we had David Banner coming. It was a great, you know, um, almost a twenty, thirty thousand dollar event. I got to this place where one of the main secretary, she asked me if I could read. Um, you know, those were the type of type of microaggressions I was receiving from her um, all over some tables and where the podium should go. Here I am, you know, um, finishing up my Ph.D., giving talks as a grad student. And someone asked me if I could read or write when it comes to some damn podium. So, you know, to me, that's it. That's the one time I cried. Um, and it could have been a little bit of something. But, you know, we we probably face all type of stuff every day, you know. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, I've experienced um, my also microaggressions, macroaggressions, um, <clears throat> being asked how it feels to be the only black person in my department. Um, somebody mentioning that they wish that the research was more, research professors were more diverse, even if it harms the quality of the research at the institution. So these, so these types of like little things that you hear that are just like, okay, well, there is, there must be a lot behind what you just said that is, it's like, it shouldn't be my job to unpack, but let's talk about that. So, um, for me, I think turning those moments into teaching moments without necessarily having to always bear the crux. Of make of being the educator, and and holding that emo and like holding that emotional burden. Um, <clears throat> so I'm definitely just always trying to walk that line, and I'm hoping that I get better at walking that line as I as I advance throughout my career. But definitely the microaggressions and macroaggressions have have been there, um, have been experienced. And I wanted to say really quickly at the end um, that we have to be more open to realizing that it's not our job. It has to become everyone else's job, too. Institutions are asking now Black folks in particular, in addition to other minorities, what should we do? Well, we have to create institutional change. You have to go back and look at every year and look what you've already done. How many minorities were in your graduating class in 1970? How many minorities were in your graduating class in 1995? How many minorities were graduating in 20, uh, you know, 2005, right? 2005. Like, if there has not been a change and, a, uh, you know, and it's been very stagnant or a decline, it should just say right there, you know, there's a problem. And that in itself is the biggest component of what we're missing. The institution sometimes doesn't want to take the responsibility of what's really going on. So that means there has to be institutional change. And it has to be cultural competence training so that it doesn't fall back on Sammy to experience the microaggression about her department thinking that we're not qualified scientists. 
if you go look up um, Eric Jarvis, he's probably one of the most well-respected scientists. But I think a lot of times people forget that he has, you know, you know, black genes as well. You know, and sometimes people forget, you know, Dale Abel. You know, they don't even, you know, my my boss, particularly Dale Abel, he's he's a Jamaican American. And a lot of times people forget that he's black. I feel like when he walked in, you know, and um, they forget because of who he is and what he represents. So a lot of times people don't, you know, want to say that there are people out there that look like us that are excellent. And what I mean by that is black skin. Um, and so we have to be also aware that there are people that are black and queer that are excellent as well. For example, Derek Applewhite, you know, he's a black scientist, but he also so happens to be queer. And he's killing the game in cytoskeleton, but we don't talk about that. We rather talk about scientists that are not there. And that's because there's institutional barriers that were created to establish us to not be there. And there are more, even more famous scientists than, you know, Derek Applewhite that we are afraid to talk about because they will rival the accomplishments of others. And so we have to be aware that it's not about first come, first serve. It's actually about the collective to be able to create the most diverse set of ideas that are going to answer the questions that we need to answer right now in science. Um, and a lot of times in the background, I see in the media all these people you know, talking about COVID as if they're the expert. But I don't see Kazmika always on TV every week like some of these other experts. And she should be the expert that's always on TV, you know, because she's the one that's leading the charge. Um, and she's the one that's been researching all this time. And so, again, the media has failed to have representation in a lot of ways. And that is the same way I feel that institutions in general have as well. So we have to be able to do cultural competence training. We have to do intersexuality training. We have to do gender you know, training. And we have to make it intentional. And we have to do mentorship training. Mentorship should be done every year. A lot of faculty are not aware of the things that they do because it's historically taught in the framework of the institution. So the institution doesn't have to come down. The pipeline doesn't have to come down. It has to be patched. And so that's the same way we have to think about things. We have to not have a diversity task force and not do things at an institution. A task force should be given money up front to actually do things and carry those things out. Thank you. So thank you all for participating in this panel today. I'd like to thank uh, Sammy Mensa, Dr. An Antonier Hinton, and Dr. M Melanie McReynolds. Also wonderful to hear from the panelists about um, their um, thoughts about health disparities within the Black and queer community, and um, also some of their thoughts as it relates to the COVID-19 vi uh, vaccine and how if we increase education and community engagement um, as ways of um, improving um, our relationship with the community and hopefully improving, um, dispelling some of the mistrust that our community often has. So thank you so much. What an amazing discussion by our panelists on how they have overcome feelings of imposter syndrome, discussing health inequities that are faced in both black and queer communities and the COVID vaccine and the importance of representation. It's really interesting to see that drag and science are not so different in the performance aspect of our careers. Darling, call me Miss Scientist. Um, anyway, grab some water and take a breather for our next amazing panel to discuss how academia can change to increase the recruitment and retention of Black queer scientists. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for um, one of our panels on institutional changes to increase recruitment and retention of Black queer scientists. We're lucky today to be joined by four great scientists across the country who have wide ranges of different types of experience and experiences in academia. And I'm really interested to see how they're doing this to be able to, you know, be their authentic selves in their academic spaces. Um, first off, my name is Brian Castellano. I am currently a postdoctoral research fellow at a biotech company called Genentech. Um, and my pronouns, I go by all pronouns. Um, I get he, him, she, hers, and I don't mind. I think all of them are beautiful. Um, and first, I'd like to start off with introducing our panelists, and we'll start off with you, Derek. Hi, my name is Derek Applewhite. 
I'm associate professor of biology at Reed College, the small liberal arts school located in Portland, Oregon. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. Awesome. Thank you, Derek. Um, and we'll pass it off over to Elle. Hi, all. I'm L. Lett. I'm an MD, PhD student at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, my PhD is in epidemiology, and I focus specifically on intersectionality and the health of transgender, non binary people and racial and ethnic minority subgroups. Um, and my pronouns are they and them. Awesome. Thank you, L. Um, I'll pass it over to Jamie. Hi, I'm Jamie Marie Stewart. I'm currently a postdoctoral scholar at Caltech, and my main focus of research uh, involves understanding how to program nucleic acids such as DNA and RNA to build structures and also uh, do functional things like detect biomolecules. Awesome. Thank you, Jamie. And last but not least, Whitney. Hi, everyone. My name is Whitney. I'm a postdoc at Boston Children's um, as well as Harvard Medical School. I study mitochondria, everything regarding mitochondria and neurodegenerative diseases, and my pronouns are she and her. Awesome. Thank you very much. And so as the panel title says, right, we're looking on how to make institutional changes to increase recruitment and retention, especially for Black queer scientists. And so just to start off, um, would one of you like to you know, define and contrast the difference between recruitment and retention at, at different institutions. Uh, I'll pass that over to you, Derek, since you're in a faculty position right now. Uh, yeah, so um, the way I look at it is anybody can recruit, but not everybody can retain. Um, and I think I run into that problem now as, as a faculty member who's in the position of trying to grow and diverse, diversify our own faculty. Um, and we've, we've had some stumbling blocks along the way. Um, I know obviously I am a black, not obviously, but I'm a black and I'm a gay man. I don't consider myself queer. Um, our, our institution has a larger, more difficult time recruiting and retaining um, people of color. Portland, Oregon happens to be a quite, a very white city. Um, Reed is slightly better in terms of statistics of in terms of diversity and representation. Um, but I think the things that come around what I'm experiencing from the faculty position is that, um, yeah, we can we can recruit people to come, and they, and they can come. But what I what I have seen happen um, uh, disturbingly is there's been something of a dropping of the ball in terms of re retaining people, um, making sure people feel like they're welcome, making sure people feel that they're that um, you know after the recruitment process is over and that they've sort of signed on that they have all the resources that they need to be successful. And I think we're not the only institution in this country that is. So that is, you know, struggling with that. Um, you know, I, I was lucky enough to find a, fall into a department where there were people that were telling me, hey, here are the things you need to do to sort of, um, you know, sort of make it here. Here are some things I did. Here's what you, sh you, you could do or implement. And I think some of the other departments at our institution just did not do a great job of that. Um, and so people get here and, um, you know, students are students. They're going to, you know, they're going to be what they are, and that means that they disproportionately um, will look down upon women and people of color in particular, and then women of color even more. Um, and so um, without having that sort of support from the, your own department and the faculty to sort of help lift you up and help you navigate the spaces in the, in the immediate, um, I think a lot of people struggle. Um, and so, again, anyone can recruit, but not everybody can retain. And I think a lot of that... Um relates to, so right now the buzzwords, at least in medical, and it may be even um, biomedical science in general, is diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think a lot of the challenges is that people don't actually know the difference between those words and don't actually um, recognize that each is important. So diversity is where everyone, they start, where the conversation usually starts and stops, where they're like, we don't have no black people, we don't have no queer people, we don't have no um, native people. I wish more people were thinking like, about that last one. And so they'll go and find some, and sometimes it'll be tokenizing. Um, Something I say is that the road to hell is paved with the good intentions of white people, because like a lot of times they really do want to, they really do care, but I think caring um, doesn't necessarily equate to like doing all the work. And so there'll be like, they will say like, 
they'll try to fire people to check these boxes, but then they don't move to the step of equity where like, it's not just bringing them into the room, it's redistributing power so that divorces are important and they can actually create change. And then they don't go from equity to inclusion where it's not about just giving them power and then letting them um, change your space, but it's also you guys doing the work to change the space and change the culture where they're safe. And so I think those last two are where retention is coming because the people from these marginalized backgrounds who make it into these elite spaces are talented. And so if you're not valuing their talent and you're not making them feel safe, they will leave because they have options because talent can open doors. Yeah, no, I think that's, those are great perspectives. Definitely. Uh, you know, you need to bring people into spaces that they could thrive and not just hope that, you know, once you have a diverse talent coming in that, Oh, they could just like, live by the same rules as everyone. And because those rules weren't made for us, those rules were not made for us to succeed. And those who do succeed in those spaces, you know, you know, aren't necessarily unique, they could be exceptional, but that doesn't mean everyone will be able to succeed in that same way. Um, thank you for um, those perspectives. Um, and now thinking like digging in a little bit deeper. Um, oh, first off, I also wanna say thank you to Elle, you know, bringing up indigenous native people, you know, that's also a great, you know, area that needs to be highlighted. Um, there's room in the space for, you know, all of the diverse talent to be able to be represented. Um, for myself, I'm on Ohlone land, um, also known as San Francisco. Um, so, you know, just recognizing the land and the space that we're in um, is also really important. Um, and now thinking and digging a little bit deeper now into recruitment of black and queer scientists. Um, do you think that this could be done simultaneously? Like, does it have to be one or the other? Like kind of, you know, the intersectionality kind of comes into play. And, you know, unfortunately in a lot of institutions, they think, oh, we need to focus on one thing. Um, but each of us here, right, we're not just that one thing and we're bringing a lot of other identities. So how do you think, you know, we could increase recruitment um, of black and queer scientists in these spaces, um, either individually, or intersectionality, or, or through intersectionality. Um, Whitney or Jamie, would you like to um, take a stab at this? Sure, I'll, I'll um, speak a little bit about that. I think, honestly, just going out and finding these groups is just plain and simple. Um, going to these different conferences, these different spaces, right? There's SACNIS, there's NSBE, there's SHIP, there's, there's so many conferences that I feel like a lot of institutions, they just look over, they don't care, um, and they don't attend. Um, as well as making use of, um, or having more so having connections with HBCUs um, and those sort of universities, HSIs, to funnel in these students where the talent is. Um, we speak about this all the time, but people neglect these institutions and they they ignore all the talent, right? I mean, <laughs> our vice president, right? And our next vice president is from uh, Spelman, correct? Um, so just just doing that, just having people on the ground and going into these groups and informing people. Yeah, do you think you could also just define HBCU and HSI in case there are people out there oh. that are unaware? Yes, of course. So um, HBCU, Historically Black uh, College University, uh, HSI, Hispanic Serving Institution. Awesome. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, Whitney, would you have like any input? I think also from a very simplistic point of view is there's a lot, from my experience, there's a lot of queer scientists already at a lot of institutions, but they feel like they have to be silent about that, about that, that part of who they are. And I think just from an institutional standpoint or even down to the department, encouraging or making you know, queer scientists feel comfortable and open um, and also welcome. I think, you know, just like, you know, when I look at different departments and if I don't see any black people, I'm I'm a little standoffish. It is the same thing I think for queer scientists. If if we felt comfortable to to live our lives as queer scientists out in the open in the lab and at conferences, I think seeing that visibility in different departments and universities will also um, help with recruitment and retention of queer scientists, specifically black queer scientists. Yeah, awesome. I mean, I think it's kind of going into our second question, right, of not only the recruitment, um, but also now how do we try to increase this retention of black queer and definitely having, you know, increased representation where people feel comfortable, you know, to be themselves is 
really important, especially when it's outward facing, right? Like you don't want to be put on the diversity, you know, recruitment pamphlet, but when people are coming to visit, you know, you want to be visible and you want to be able to be your authentic self. Um, and this kind of goes, you know, more into, uh, when you kind of touched upon this, um, a lot of queer people, you know, potentially have the privilege of passing as, you know, heteronormative or heterosexual. Um, and being black, you're not, you're not able to do that, right? You're, that's not something that you're able to um, hide away from for most black people. And I guess my question here is for all of you coming into these spaces, these academic spaces, you know, getting educated, getting recruited. Um, how have you managed your own intersectionality in this space, right? There's already one bind that people talk about, and, you know, that's being a person of color or, in your cases, being Black, right? And that already has some, you know, potential discriminatory, you know, connotations around it that people may have. And then now bringing in, oh, I'm also queer, you know, a double bind. Um, so kind of can you all talk or one of you talk about, you know, your experiences you know, trying to be your full authentic self and bringing your queer identity, you know, into your professional spaces? I have the privilege of, of looking male identified and carrying that male privilege with me. And so I think from the get go, I also was very open about the fact that I was gay and I, m m all of my students know it, it comes up. I talk about my partner um, in terms of my lecture on occasion when it's appropriate, it makes sense for me to bring him up. Um, so I've, I've always been really forward about that. And I had an experience in grad school where I wasn't out to my, uh, my advisor at the time. And that made for a very difficult and very strained relationship. And so I made a very I mean, a conscious choice that when I went on to postdoc, um, and, and went on to the faculty position that I, that I, that I have now, um, that I was going to be open about all aspects of my life, including the fact that I'm gay. Um, and uh, I was very open about it during the interview process. I, I brought up my partner's name on several occasions because they're not really supposed to ask. And I, and I waited and looked and watched for reactions because I did not want to step forward and take a position in a place where I would have to go back in the closet or hide a little bit of who I was. Um, so. And, but I, I brought up the male privilege and that I look male identified is because students tend to push back less, tend to question less men they, than they do women or women identified people. So um, I, I recognize that privilege and, I, and, and from that aspect, I think I, I might have had it easier that way. Um, but I, I was very forward and, and um, upfront and I still am to this day with, um, with all my students. Um, I'd also like to weigh in on this one. Um... So I'm trans and non-binary, but I am male-bodied. And to the extent that I pass or don't pass, um, it's context-dependent, I think. Um, but I will say that this has probably been one of the most significant challenges of my entire academic career. I went to undergrad at Harvard. I went to grad school at Duke, and now I'm at Penn. And a lot of these spaces have been challenging for me because of the intersections of those identities, um, specifically, like, a lot of times these institutions are trying to cater to those identities in an effort to become more diverse or inclusive. And like, I mean, one like nuts and bolts example is that when I was being recruit, when I was like going through the recruitment stuff to come to Penn, like all the minority events were at the same time. So I had to go to the black event or the queer event. I could never be both. And that like is indicative of my experiences at Penn um, and all those places. Like my, also another layer is that my work is focused on intersectionality and trans people. So I live in it from day to day with the work I publish and the things that I, the panels I speak on, all this stuff, not just about the, my identity, but about my people that I like study and support and like uplift through my work. And so it's makes a lot of times as a navigator, my scientific identity feels deeply personal. And sometimes I, I struggle with, um, and I speak, I'm speaking about this because a lot of, I mean, we there have been studies that show, like at the NIH, we don't they don't fund the work that Black people are drawn to, which is a lot of times health equity stuff. They fund it differentially and things like that. And so I can imagine there are other scientists with my identity who are balancing this personal aspect to their work. And a lot of times, I'm in the spaces where I'm talking to a bunch of queer scientists, like at a lot of the the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association conference, but there aren't any Black people in the room. And so all of their work, or a lot of their work, is just like race agnostic, which I don't think is I'm um, important when you're talking about marginalized communities. And then the flip side at like black conferences, like SNMA, when um, there are things that just like 
or in not any specific conference because those are very important spaces and I don't want to demean them. But sometimes they aren't as inclusive for people who live at other intersections than the one that they're catering to at that moment. And so I think it creates a lot of tension. And for me, it can be isolating. And so I often, my network is not physically bound in like where I'm at because I have to use places like Twitter and like other resources to like connect with other people who share these experiences with me. That was a bit rambly, but yeah. No, yeah, I, I like how, you know, you you talk about, you know, having community and if you don't have it in your own spaces, you know, to look out there either at conferences or Twitter, science Twitter, LGBTQ Twitter, right? There's a lot of different um, spaces out there to get support that we might not have at our own institutions. Um, and I really appreciate what you said, Derek, you know, being your full authentic self with your students, right? It's a great thing. Like, I was lucky in undergrad that my professor I worked in the lab of um, was a gay male. And he gave me his perspective, similar to what you said of like going on interviews and seeing reactions and trying to, you know, determine by those reactions, is this a safe place for him to do his research? Exactly. Um, Jamie or Whitney, would you like to talk a little bit about the intersectionality that you've all been able to um, experience going through these academic spaces? Um, I can speak a little bit. Um, I generally pass as heteronormal. Um, so, which for me is uncomfortable to be honest because people are so quick to make assumptions. Um, and I, depending on where I am, I know when I was interviewing for here at Boston, well, Boston Children's and Harvard, you know, if you've been in Boston, you see, you know, rainbow flags and you see, them, oh, we're so inclusive, we're so understanding, we're so welcoming. But when you go into individual labs and departments, you, you feel, you don't feel that. It's, it's very cold and being there already the only black person in a department and people already assume, black woman, people assume that I'm the admin instead of a postdoc. Then to add another level of, um, of my intersexuality of being being queer, it 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 does it it hurts in the sense that you know different conversations happening in the lab that are really meant to me directly because it's who I am. It's it's hard to navigate, and so I had to when I was interviewing, I did something very similar. Um, I I and people say, oh, do you have a boyfriend or a husband? It's you know, and then it's like I have to decide: am I going to go with this or not? You know what I mean? And for, through graduate school, I kind of went with it, to be honest. Um, but as a postdoc and having a partner, um, I needed to find a way in the space to do that. Um, and so now I just kind of lay it all out there. And if I'm not going to feel welcome, I, I pass on that. Because at the end of the day, I want to be able to have pictures of my partner on my desk too. Like, why can't I do that? I want to be able to to refer to my partner by their, their pronoun and bring my partner to lab events. Whereas before I I didn't feel like I could. And so living in a city that claims to be inclusive, but day to day, there's a lot of, you know, uh, issues with that. Um, you just have to find your one, your community and two, just your own self-confidence and self-worth because people aren't going to, to, to be welcoming once they find out that not only am I, I'm a woman, I'm also black and I'm queer. Like that's crazy. And so um, I think for the intersectionality of it, it's 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 tough day to day, but you find you just kind of have to find your confidence in it and leave it where it is. So. Well, I love that you said. Well, something you said reminded me of like the moment where I stopped, decided to stop compromising on my identity in these spaces, and I'm just like, like honestly, if you're going to discriminate against me, I'm I'm real black. Like you're going to be able to tell that at the front. So like, <laughs> I might as well try to stop hiding other stuff. Yep. it's all a package deal. Um, and it's very liberating once you get to that point. And it's, you know, and I don't want to come to work every day and be stressed out because I have to watch if I say she or him when I'm, when I'm referring to my partner. I want to, if someone says, oh, what did you do this weekend? I don't want to say, oh, I just sat at home when I really went on a date with my partner. And I think people think it's just a simple thing. It's so simple to other people, but it's huge for us. And if this uh, ends up being watched by like non-black people too, like I just want to say like there are some people who, like a well-intentioned ally in a, in a space can change a moment for you. Like I have a lot of piercings and I was on a rotation with this really done up family medicine doctor and he saw me tuck one away. And he was like, don't let this space decide who you are. This was a white man. 
And I was like, you can say that. It's easy for you, white like, man, to say that. But then I was like, but no, you saw me in this moment. And like, this is that is the power of true allyship. Like, I will remember him for the rest of my life. He said, don't let this place change who you are. People will decide, let, pick their positions for themselves. You got to be who you are. And that was just so powerful. So that's what allies can do to help create that space for people to be unabashedly themselves. Sorry to keep jumping in. But I was vibing with you. No, you're fine. You're good. We're here. <laughs> That was beautifully said um, by Whitney L and and Derek. Uh, fantastic points. I just want to piggyback off of that a little bit um, of just being in your authentic self. So now, depending on the day and what I'm wearing, um, like I'm pretty androgynous appearing. Um, uh, however, like when I was younger, I used to have straighter hair, so I could pass for the most part. Um, and then I just got to a point where it was pretty much like you know why would I want to be in a space where people don't respect me or they don't, you know what I mean? They don't like my presence. So um, I started making it a point, but like to put on my CV that I was on the chancellor's committee for, you know, LGBTQ plus inclusion, these sorts of things, let it be known. So we don't have any problems at all up front. Um, I was particularly um, keen on that when I was uh, going up for a postdoc, um, uh, looking for a postdoctoral advisor. And it's like, look, and I'm, I'm so lucky I'm in a great position with the uh, advisor I have right now um, who totally respects me completely. Um, like <laughs> um, we've even started uh, reading black literature back and forth and whatnot, like this, this white guy, like it's just fantastic. And I'm really happy that I decided to show up in my authentic self and not try to dilute or trying to hide or whatnot, you know, who I am, um, because I want to be in a space where I'm accepted hundred percent and like not tiptoe around anyone else. I, I, I do want to say that I, I want to make sure it's clear that it hasn't always been this easy and that I did a lot of swallowing of who I was. Um, that was very detrimental to my own mental health. And you also get therapists because it's very important to have a therapist. Um, but I, I, I've, and I, at a mature age, have started to realize how detrimental that was, where I just sang the song and danced the dance to get along, to get by, to put my head down and just worry about the work and not worry about who I was. And, and lost a bit. I lost lots, lost lots of chunks of myself to my profession to get to where I am. And I really, 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 because I can tell, by the way, I'm much older than all y'all. Um, I really, really want the younger generation not to do that, not to lose themselves to the profession because you want to get, you want to fit in, you want to pass. I realize I have a lot of privilege because I'm in a position that I've always wanted, but to get here, I had to su swallow a lot of who I was. And it's just not, it's not, it's not worth it in the end. It really isn't mental health wise. It's not worth it. Yes. And also, um, I, I wanted to follow that with um, make sure that you feel safe and comfortable, of course. Um, and that can be in your career, your own personal safety or whatnot. Um, you have to do what's right for you. I remember speaking to um, a uh, lesbian professor, a gay woman professor, and she pretty much told me that, look, I came out after I got tenure you have to do what's best for you but this is this is my story this is what i did so of course like you have to be in your comfort zone and, and what feels right for you and just to because i um uh, derek what you said feels so affirming and it is but there's also some challenges in that too as someone who i guess you're referencing as in that younger generation i mean i also like I don't think, I think change is slow because I it, I just got to this person. Like I am unabashedly queer and black in these spaces. I make, I, I make people sit in the discomfort with me when I'm, when there's things that we're talking on challenging. I think it, these spaces aren't catered to me. So if who I am makes you uncomfortable, we get to sit in it and share in that together and we get to learn together. But it took me years. I'm 29. I, I've been in academia for over 10 years. Um, at these type of elite institutions, and I would say that's the last three. That's the last three of them. And so, like, I, I, I vibe. There's a lot of tension in what uh, Jamie and Derek said because you do have to do what's safe. Or like, I have been, I have made choices to be authentic that have come with consequences that have cost me opportunities that have almost ended my early career in ways. And so, like, 
that's that 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 that's that's like I think what I can say is that I'm happier because of those choices and that I wouldn't go back and change them and I'm much and the in the me that's inside of all of this stuff, the me that's like not all about academia is better off. But I can't p- tell people to go and be unabashedly themselves without letting them know that there might be moments where it costs you. But the cost for me was worth it and I hope it's worth it for you too. And I think that what Elle just said was something I dealt with is if I am my authentic self, how many opportunities would I lose not based off of my CV? I can have an impressive CV. Heck, I can publish in a New England Journal of Medicine, but are they going to care about that when they find out that I'm queer? And I, I faced these challenges as well as my partner. When my partner was applying to residency, it's do we, if you do mention me in a personal statement, do we use pronouns or do we keep pronouns out? And I think that right there is a struggle in itself is that you don't want to be judged on this, your, you know, the color of your skin or your, or if you're queer or not. And I think that's the struggle um, of balancing, am I okay losing this opportunity? Um, and because I've also felt like I've lose off, I'm sure all of us probably feel that way. We've lost opportunities or we don't, we don't have the fair, a fair chance when we walk into a room, when we watch, walk into a seminar. Um, and so that is still a challenge that I think a lot of us face is I want to be judged off what I can do at the bench or what I can do um, in a classroom, not based on anything else. Yeah, no, I think this conversation is, I have like notes of like, oh, I want to talk about this. Oh, I want to talk about this. Oh, I want to talk about this. Um, I think definitely, I think one thing that I want to highlight for Jamie, for all of our you know viewers out there is, you know, be your authentic self, but, you know, know your environment and make sure you're safe, right? Um, we all have privileges here, right? In this, on this panel of, you know, having advanced degrees, right? That protect us in some ways from the discrimination that others may face because we have a PhD or we're getting a PhD. Um, and so I think that's the first thing, right? It's, you know, make, make sure you're safe to be your authentic self. Um, and if you have that courage to be able to do that. Um, and I think all of these areas are kind of going into retention, right? Like how do we increase retention in these spaces? Um, some of the things that uh, Derek talked about was about assimilation, you know, and like trying to be who we think we're supposed to be in these spaces. Whitney talked about, you know, not wanting to have to do that or have to code switch in these spaces, um, which take a lot of energy. Do any of you want to talk a little bit more of, you know, how code switching and, you know, being able to be liberated, um, as one of you said earlier, like, how does that look in your work? Like, once you're able to, you know, let down those guards and just be you in these spaces. I, I will say, um, I'll keep brief. Um, there's a certain amount of mental um, work, effort to that you use to to get along in a, an environment where you don't feel 100% comfortable. And so, when part of your brain is directed towards these other distractions, it doesn't allow yourself to fully open up and think about the problems at hand. I'm a cell biologist. I study cells. I try to understand how cells move and how they change shape. And I'm trying to understand these proteins, these interactions, these fine molecular details. But I can't fully focus on my job when I'm worried about how I'm coming off to others because of things I can't control. And so letting that go and letting that down opens up parts of your brain that were just occupied with trying to fit in and to um, get by. And so um, one of the benefits of being able to be out and be your authentic self is like your brain can now work on what's important. Like I need to work on what's important right now, which is like try to understand how these two proteins are interacting in this, this place in the cell. I can stop worrying about other things because now I could just focus on that. So that is a reason why we need to be our authentic selves is because your brain does this work that you don't really want to do um, and it keeps you from it. But um, like we've already said in many different ways, it's not necessarily that easy to get there. And there are many different ways to get there, I suppose. Yeah. I'll think of code switching as a skill, actually. So like for me, I like, when because when I relate to patients, like I'm, I'm, from rural North Carolina, like I'm country, country, like I, and so like, 
and I have this way of speaking and this way of being that I cultivate these places that I sometimes I default to to navigate these spaces. But when I'm with a patient who I know is from a similar background as me, like I become that person. We have a level of camaraderie that like um, our rapport gets like that and I'm better able to do my job, which is my, my job is to learn to heal people and then eventually to heal them when I finish school. So um, I think code switching is a talent. I, not as a talent, it's a skill that you can use. I don't think it's, it depends on your audience. Like if I'm meeting with the like, dean of the medical school like i'm not gonna talk like i talk at home it's just i wish i could say i could but i, I just can't like, like he's this old white man who like from a different totally different space and if to be respected to be understood and to make progress for what i'm there to talk about i just can't be that person but i take advantage of being that person when i can and so i think of it as code switching is another toolkit to drive change and I use it when I can. I'm happiest when I don't have to, but it's there. Yeah, no, thank you all for sharing. And I think another topic that was such a on, um, right, which would also impact retention is mental health. Um, and I think from your story that you told earlier, Elle, about allyship and, you know, that resident or that doctor saying, you know, be you, like, don't hide your piercings, just be there. I'm sure, like, relieved a lot of, like, mental stress that you know you may have also had in that space and so all my um, black we, mentees the first thing i asked them have you found a therapist in philly yet and the first time i see them yes absolutely um would anyone else like to talk a little bit about mental health or like how institutions you know could be better at providing these services especially for black and queer you know students or faculty members or staff pay for it Throw money at it. Yeah. Just that simple. Open that checkbook. And we asked them to do it. They ain't done it yet. <laughs> yes. No, definitely. I mean, I, I second, you know, find a therapist. If you don't like your first one, you know, find another one. If you don't like your second one, just keep going. It's like dating. You know, you're going to get a couple that you just don't vibe with. And once you get that person that vibes with you, um, it, it's a great feeling because a therapist's goals, right, isn't to fix you when you're broken. It's to give you the toolkits so that you're ready for when adversity actually does come at your door. And then you have an ally there to be able to be like, okay, I, I did these skills. Now I need additional help from you. Yeah. And sorry, my comment was a little flippant or glib, but I really do agree with Derek. And I really do think we need to, at each of our respective institutions, like assemble and drive them to pay and subsidize the expenses of therapy, especially for people from marginalized backgrounds. It's evidence-based. It's there's, We can prove that we have different experiences that lead to a differential mental health burden. And so as the institutions that benefit from our talent and our work, you need to compensate us for that by supporting us to be healthy and safe in your place. I also think institutions they should definitely fork the bill for mental health um, services, but also they should also make sure that the therapists or counselors that they provide can be allies to all people. Um, and I say that because I ran into an issue with the therapist where I sat there for an hour and divulged my whole life for her to tell me she wasn't going to be able to be my therapist because I was queer. And so that right there was a tough pill to swallow. So I, I think for institutions, generally you walk in, I know from my experience, from the institutions I've been at, you have, you know, older white males or women um, that come off as heteronormal, whether they are, I don't know. And so it's not a safe space for, for people who have different um, intersectionalities. And so institutions really should make sure that that the services that they're providing are for, you know, a diverse um, group of people that represent, you know, all people, whether Black, Native American, LGBT, or um, anything like that. So that's important for institutions to take into consideration as well. Yeah, absolutely. If some of our viewers out there, you know, you're interested in psychology, you're interested in counseling, you're interested in psychiatry, like go into it and like emphasize, you know, in people of color 
in indigenous communities because there is a demand. I have, a, we have a lot of, I'm sure we have a lot of queer, you know, by POC people out there that are looking for therapists they could identify with. And, you know, unfortunately they can't find that. And so if you're out there, look for it um, and try to, you know, be better our communities by, you know, being an additional support in this, in these spaces. And black people, we have to own a medical, our, we have reasonable medical mistrust. But we also have to own our stigmatizing as a culture of mental health treatment. Um, which is something our community is actively working on. People are doing great work, and I'm proud to say that. Um, but that means that, like, we have to um, lean on each other and, like, be open about speaking therapy. Like, help. Each- it's hard to find a therapist that can help to support Black people sometimes. So, like, share your therapist. Tell people about them. Like, give recommendations. Open. Like, I purposely speak openly about my own mental health struggles in medical school and going on leave and like getting the mental health support and things like that because I want to destigmatize that for our community. And I think that's something we all are complicit in and have to break down. I think that's a good point, Al. I know when I went to my, I found a black therapist and a psychiatrist. I don't know how I, this happened. And the first time I met, met with my therapist, she couldn't believe that she had a black client, like a black patient. It was just as shocking and comfortable for her to see my face as it was for me to see her face. And so I think just like you said, be open about mental health, be open that, you know, we are also seeking therapy and emotional support to kind of, you know, make other people feel comfortable because it's, it's a real issue. Yeah, I think a lot of these conversations, right, especially about retention and building inclusive environments is all about community, right? Like, how do we build these communities within our institutions, within our spaces? Elle, you mentioned earlier, you know, you reach out to people on Twitter so that you could have, you know, find people with similar identities. Um, Coming in, you know, there's a lot of stigma talking about mental health, especially in Black and, you know, uh, communities of color. Um, Do any of you have any suggestions on, you know, how in these spaces can you like fight against the stigma about talking about mental health and, you know, being honest um, with your mental health state? I mean, I think just being open and talking about it in general. I mean, I, I, I spent the majority of my life needing therapy and not actually getting the help I needed. Um, It took a pretty hard break um, post tenure sort of breakdown of all of the things I've been holding up and, hel- and holding to get to that last hurdle for me to realize, like, I really need to take a look at myself and figure out, like, what's happening and how I've been operating. Um, and so I think just being honest about it and, and the more we talk about it, the less it becomes a thing. Um, and we and give and the less it has power over us. And it's just another thing that I do. Um, it's like, you know, when I get a checkup for, you know, my year checkup, you get, you get your head, you can just go and have a, a conversation and, and, and then you go about your day. Um, yeah. It's a frequency thing, like talking about it frequently, but it's also when you talk about it, like I'm I confidently say that I'm in a space where I'm being very successful. And so me saying that I'm in therapy right now is different or people in who are like, having Derek, a tenured professor, talking about going to therapy like it's a normal checkup right now is very powerful because it normalizes it as something that's just like we should all be doing. It doesn't have to be when you're broken and in, in a, as an urgent intervention. Therapy is prophylaxis. Therapy is stability. And like framing it that way so that it's a part of our like normal medical vocabulary is how you do it, I think. And so I talk about it often. And I also think when we talk about being our authentic selves, that is part of being our authentic selves. And so being able to to bring that into the space of when we talk about who we are is also talking about um, maintaining our mental health. And so bringing it up as much as possible. I have a tech and I also I asked her, you go therapy. You know what I mean? And so um, and not from like a you need help type point of view, but we all need it. And um, and so being your authentic self and showing your authentic self is also being being transparent to that I I need someone to talk to and it feels good. And I tell people, just go one time. And if you don't feel better, 
then we can have a conversation. But nine times out of 10, after you go one time, you're going to feel better and you're going to realize the importance of it. And so bring that to the table when you bring yourself to the table. Yeah, awesome. Thank you all for um, you know having this blunt conversation about mental health. Um, I, I'm sure a lot of people are able to relate. I definitely relate. Um, and thinking about you know, ourselves in these institutions, in these academic spaces, um, there's a thing called like equity ethics, right? Like I think Elle touched upon this earlier. You wanna do work that can positively impact your own community. Um, and so a lot of service, um, what do you call it? Service work in, in institutions, right? It's like student government, you know, in grad school or something along those lines. You look at who's doing it and the majority are women and people of color, right? You never typically see a majority um, white, cis, hetero, you know, service oriented body um, in these institutions. Um, and it's because we feel like we have to build these spaces for not only others that are coming in, but also for ourselves, right, to thrive. Um, and so that's also termed a little bit of a minority tax, right? Oh, we're expected, you know, to do these outreach events. We're expected, you know, to be on these diversity committees. Um, going a little bit back towards allyship, what could, you know, non-Black faculty or non-Black staff or the institutions in general do to help, you know, create environments while also not draining, you know, their diverse talent and di diverse student body? Um, does anyone have any ideas or things that they've seen at their institutions where you're like, that works? Or something that you're like, I wish they would do this and I don't have to do this. I think um, having uh, allies step into leadership roles um, is really, really important. I'm thinking back about some of the, um, some of the, the um, non, uh, the not the white allies stepping into roles of leadership and taking up, like, I will do this diversity equity work I can do this as a white person. And there's certain privileges I bring with me when I do this work as a white person and not always, again, putting the person of color on that committee or putting the person of color on to be the chair of that, that, that committee. I think um, just stepping up into that role and acknowledging and bringing your privileges with you to that role and acknowledging the privilege you have, I think is really important. And I've seen some really powerful people step into these roles and um, um, take up this mantle and, and um, lead this charge. And, Again, not to take a center away the voice from Black and Indigenous people, because I think that voice should be centered, but always putting that work on us to do it is the problem. Um, and it's, we did not create this, right? Right? If you, if you mess up the kitchen, you gotta clean it, right? So there's, there's something to be said about that. Um, so I, I, it's very important, and I think, I, I, and, and again, in, from a career standpoint too. I mean, building up your CV and building up what you've done, if you're constantly being put into these committees, um, and you're not a chance, you don't give giving a chance to do other things, um, other types of out, outreach, other types of work within um, an institution, that also can be a problem. So not being on, be, always being put on these committees um, is 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 important. So I've written about this pretty extensively and I'm going to try to be brief because I get very incensed about this subject and so I think it's really important that this work gets done but the issues of retention is at least partially linked to the minority tax. If I am on every single committee that is vaguely related to diversity then I am not writing, I am not publishing, I am not building my work and I am not going to get tenured. If um, and I think it, now to, to sum it up, it comes down to making it in a shared responsibility and value of your entire institution. Black people and queer people and people with these identities oftentimes are leading these efforts from an experiential space. But there is scholarship and education and people who are trained in these spaces. If, you're, if your department is over budget every year and you are not um, producing enough research, your institution your department hires an external contractor to come in, do an audit, and revise how your structure works. There are whole consulting firms who do GI stuff. A lot of them are Black and queer-led. And you know what that does? Allows you to compensate people for their labor and then allow your people who are here to be safe 
and to continue to do their work so that you can retain them. So when you get them up for tenure review and the metrics that you use to evaluate them, their paper frequency, all these other things, they have actually been given the space to progress along those ways. So it comes down to shared values, white, if, and this is, this is, I'm just, I'm trying to be brief, I promise. But um, that we have demonstrated that diverse spaces improve everyone's education and improves the quality of the work that you do, especially in medicine. So if you're making all of your minorities do this work, you're essentially making them do work as the minority to benefit the majority. We've seen that before, and there's some ugly words for it. So for free labor like that. So you have to recontextualize. This is like, oh, y'all making us better. So we have to do the work to make y'all safe. So that's why it's a shared value thing. It's your obligation to fix this. And that was kind of brief. (laughs) Yeah, no, absolutely, right? Like it goes back, like, you know, pay it. You know, there are people that are out there that are black, that are queer, that are people of color, that want to do this work and that you don't have to rely you know, on your own diverse talent, you know, that might may already already, that may already be spread really thin. Um, Because some of the feelings that I've had, I read a tweet earlier, it was like, oh, I got invited to be on another diversity committee, and I just don't want to do it. But I know if I'm not on it, they're not going to do it right. Right. And it's like, because we need our voices there and, you know, outsource it. There's companies like El said that are, are able to do that. I would resp- I want to respond to that directly before we move on. Yeah. It is people burn their whole careers. They break their bodies and their minds trying to do that. I have this is the first year where I said if I'm not being cop, I have I was on a, I was a recruitment chair for all the different the black and the queer group at the same time. All those things I said if I'm not being compensated, if it's not going to benefit me directly, if I can't turn into something that will advance my career, I am saying no. And the first three no's were real hard, and I felt real bad. The next seven weren't. So just build the muscle. <laughs> because you got you to gotta sustain yourself. And these institutions change very slowly. And I've given, if you, if you look back on what you've given and recognize that maybe it's time to, get, to give to yourself. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, looking at our panel and, you know, looking at your CVs, I think Jamie mentioned this earlier, you know, you kind of put up a front on your CVs, right? Like, look at all these things that I'm able to do or that I've accomplished or, you know, identities that I might may hold. Um, I think Whitney talked a little bit about, you know, putting pronouns on resumes and like, how do you go about that? Um, looking at, you know, where all of you were able to go to school, right? We have people who went to school on the West Coast, in the Midwest, in the South, on the East Coast. Um, and some have moved between different regions. Um, do any of you want to talk to, you know, your different, experiences being in a different region or coming into a different school and being like okay I need to adjust and like kind of how did you do that end or how did the institutions help you adjust in those spaces so um originally I'm from Chicago that's where I um completed my bachelor's degree and then for grad school I came to California um so my interpretation or my view of California, what I thought California was, was okay, you know, diversity and, um, um, you know, I'll have this community of, of um, all of these different people. Um, so of course, um, academia is, isn't necessarily a representation of society, clearly. Um, but more so, I think I was shocked at, um, I don't know, um, it just seemed like the diversity really drastically dropped off. Um, And I feel like sometimes people take the term diversity and they just think it means, well, there's not a lot of white people, but if there's still a majority at the school and if, for example, if um, black students are being mistreated and if they're suffering, you know, that's not (laughs) necessarily, um, I mean, uh, one can consider a diverse and inclusive environment. Um, I think what kind of shocked me is uh, the little remnants of like anti-blackness that tend to seep into academia. And it, it kind of, it took me by surprise, it took me back um, when I first got here because, you know, getting it from 
non, you know, non-white people. It's people who um, may be of Asian descent or uh, Latinx or whatnot. I think that's what really shocked me. I'm like, this is uh, kind of crazy in California um, and in academia. And then I, I also have to keep in mind as well that, right, I'm moving from a bachelor's to a graduate program. So, of course, the dynamics and, and whatnot are changing. But I think I kind of was taken aback by that where um, it didn't necessarily seem like that inclusive of a space. And, yeah. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing sharing that experience, Jamie. Uh, Whitney, would you like to um, add anything? So I'm from South Carolina. <laughs> so oh, I, I probably, we probably can uh, relate to this very, very well. Um, and you went to Boston too, like I did, so. <laughs> we <laughs> <talk Right. after. laughs> so um, growing up in South Carolina, um, you know, it's Bible Belt, you know, so there's already struggles right there, just not even talking about the academia portion of it. When I went to college, um, I went to college as straight, okay? And I was straight to everyone. That's that's what, I was heteronormal. I That's what I was, and that's what I wanted people to, that's not what I was, that's what I wanted people to see. And so I didn't really start coming out, to be honest, to my friends until I made a friend with someone who was gay. And then I felt comfortable enough because the school I went to and like what Jamie says, as you progress from bachelor's to graduate to, to postdoc to faculty, it seems like the diversity just continues to, to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And so when I think about undergrad, I was in, I felt privileged now I'm thinking about it because I had as much diversity as I was going to see. I didn't know it at the time. And I think, you know, from there, from South Carolina, coming to Boston, like I mentioned earlier, you know, Boston is this inclusive place, but in, in the academia world at Harvard, it's really not. Um, and so there's corners that you may find diversity and acceptance and inclusion, but out in the open is not there. Um, and so I think coming from, even though I came to a city that's inclusive, I still have the mindset of being in South Carolina. Um, and what that means for me. And that's not a good place to be. Um, and so I learned how to code switch in South Carolina and I find myself doing it here. Um, and so there is a big question going, wanting to go into to academia, will that ever change? But I, I guess growing up in South Carolina has done me a favor in the sense that I know how to code switch really well. <laughs> um, and that's just what it, that's just what it was. I, I did some time in Durham. I, I was at UNC Chapel Hill for my postdoc. I have to say Durham might be one of the most diverse cities I've ever lived in. I was in grad school at Northwestern in Chicago, um, and Chicago might be one of the most segregated cities I've lived in. Um, and it's so fascinating to me, um, comparing and contrasting, just like my social life, um, you know, Chicago, most of the black people live in the West or in the South. Um, I remember going to a bar in Durham with some friends and looking around and every single table had, everybody was sitting. Now, it wasn't like parts of the restaurant. It was like every single table was mixed. And I don't know that it, there's a lot of places like that in this country. I'm even in Portland, because sadly, Portland, most black people have been chased away. Um, you know, I see a black person just like, oh, you're here too? Like, <laughs> like, that's how bad it is. Getting off the airport in another city from coming from Portland, I'm, when we I'm back when we could fly, because God knows that's not a thing we do anywhere right now. I just looking around and be like, wow, there are so many. Black so I've kind of I've lived in some different places and I've experienced, you know, I think the height of diversity might have been when I was in Durham, to be honest with you. Even though I was at Ann Arbor for for undergrad, the height of diversity might have been in Durham. That's interesting. I have threads with you. I went. I'm from North Carolina. I did two years at Duke and Durham. We had the same experience. Um, and then Whitney, you and I uh, shared Boston. I, my trajectory was from rural North Carolina to Harvard. And that was, and I, I don't know if this question was to get at like specific places and experiences, but I will say that uh, I encountered more racism in Boston and at Harvard than I had growing up in North Carolina. Um, and I found like the best part about Harvard was being the black community there because the 
adversity we experienced made us super tight. Like we're fam. Like I call I black. I say I was, I say I graduated from Black Harvard. Um, and like, um, and in Durham, I, I will I'll say that I have had the most affirming and the most diverse experience diverse experiences I've ever had here in Philadelphia. Um, but unfortunately, racism and homophobia and transphobia are everywhere. And so it changes shape. It looks different in North Carolina than it does in Boston and it does it, than it does in Philadelphia. But it's everywhere. I mean, even Boston, all the Black people live in one place. Dorchester. Um, Dorchester, right. Roxbury. So it's very segregated in that sense, just in the physical sense. When you go to a place and it's physically segregated, you already know mental, they're mental. They're also segregated and they also have so many different phobias in their head. If they can't even share space physically or share a corner uh, with someone. And so when you see that walking in, you're, you're already, you know, your walls are up already. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, thank you for sharing, you know, your experiences dealing with diversity and or racism in different regions of the country. Um, I think one thing that Jamie mentioned was, you know, about anti-Blackness. And this might not be a popular opinion amongst scientific institutions, but science is steeped in systemic racism, right? It's like they on, might not it's wanna, built on it. they, it's built on it, institutions that I've been at don't want to admit it. They're like, oh, it is a problem, but not here. And it's like, you're not immune to this. And so I want to kind of touch on anti-Blackness and how this works at in academia or in institutions. And kind of like, when we're doing recruitment and we know, how do you judge an applicant, right? The criteria that we judge on, publications, you know, labs that they worked in, letters of references, right? there is systemic racism in that, right? If you see a, a student coming in with a cell nature or science paper or a high, quote unquote, high impact paper, right? What institutions are able to fund that type of research that is highly sought after by those journals, right? It's known that, you know, historically black colleges and universities, um, Hispanic serving institutions, tribal colleges um, are funded way less are grant are, are receive less grants, federal grants or research grants. And so the research that one can do at those places because of monetary constraints, right, can look vastly different. And so if we're thinking about recruitment and trying to bring in this diverse talent, um, can we talk a little bit about, you know, what are best strategies to, you know, evaluate candidates and, you know, try to take away that systemic bias that's already ingrained in how we judge people. Um, I know, Elle, you mentioned that you are on recruitment for different, you know, varieties. I'm sure, Derek, you're doing that for faculty as well as students. Um, Jamie and Whitney, you've been in grad school and are currently postdocs. Um, what are all of your experiences or advice in those spaces of, you know, how to make it more equitable in the recruitment process? So I've actually sat on the admissions committee at um, the medical school here. And one of the things that I could advocate for and have had frustrating conversations about, and also positive conversations about, is that we have to change the metrics. Like, we just have to change the metrics we use for evaluation. Yes, Black people have, on average, lower MCAT scores. Yes, um, Black people, on average, have published things. But, but what is the causal mechanism from that? You either have it's one of two things. You believe that there's a talent deficit or ability deficit, which makes you racist, um, because that's just not the case. Um, and we can show when you put people like me or people like Derek or people like Jamie or people like Whitney, and you give them resources at the quality. And actually, there have been studies that have shown that um, there has been a study that showed that Black scientists actually do more impactful work based on novelty and um, novelty and like um like citations and stuff but even not even t putting on these faulty metrics to like justify our existence we need to if we are serious about diversity because we have to change and we know that the metrics we use are racist we have to change them you just have to put your money where your mouth is and say okay there's problems with the mcat let's think about distance travel matrix let's think about people's individual context let's think about the fact that like i've been in, in a situation where i'm advocating for students who as one of those students who had to tutor to, um, I, I didn't go to get a Fulbright, which was very prestigious. I tutored and taught to make money for myself. Like those, we have to look at those metrics and realize that they're context dependent 
and start valuing the things that black people do and brown people do and queer people do to compensate for the experiences of structural oppression as things that measure talent because that's what they do. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, you touch on a, a really important um, thing, Brian, that uh, science is a human endeavor. And as long as humans are involved in it, we're going to bring all the shit that we bring in everything that we do. So I'm, I'm not here for that conversation that this is a pure thing that we, because it's not, it's not a pure thing. I think that's one of the most frustrating things um, is that it's a human endeavor. Um, I'm, I'm, I, El, you made some fantastic points. A couple things. We cannot passively expect people of color to come to positions. It is an active process. You want to diversify your faculty, you have to get off your butt and find them. They are not coming to you. It is an active process, not a passive one. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say was, um, and this is frustrating, but also very um, illuminating to me. Um, um, in the in the wake of the George Floyd um, demonstrations across the entire country, um, it seems like the scientific community recognized, oh my God, there are black scientists. We should probably have them do things like come give seminars. And so I have received so many invitations to seminars since June, I would say, to now, that it's amazing. Um, and what's so frustrating about this situation is I have picked up nuggets of knowledge, um, experiments I should be trying. People have been offering to collaborate, wanting to send me agents. This is why people do seminars, is to spread the word. And I was denied these. I was denied these until the rest of the world recognized black scientists should also probably be doing seminars. And our students want to see black scientists giving seminars. But the flip side of that is the networking and this bridge building and these just these reagents, I can it's all also for capital. It's also it, for capital that is just denied to us because we don't look like that. Denied, absolutely. Um, I, you know, I could feel my blood pressure going up, but um, it's it is the truth. Like these these moments are so critical, especially for a young scientist. You know, if I have had this kind of exposure and networking earlier, you know, who knows. Um, I'm thankful for where I am now, and I'm and I'm very happy and proud. But um, it's just it's been an interesting and illuminating time for me because my because my science critically engages structural racism. It has been both imp- interesting. It's been interesting to see people wake up to it, like, oh, racism's real, and like I've been frustrated by people who like aren't capitalizing on it and doing honestly with poor quality science because. The number of people, and I'm not going to say no names, but I almost did, um, but the number of scientists who I've seen write, like, think pieces in New England Journal of Medicine or, like, write ethical pieces, I'm like, I know you personally, and I know you haven't been engaged in this work, and I know, I, I wish those journals, I wish those people would be critical of, like, who's writing this? What, have they been engaged in this work before? Because what is their expertise? Combating racism is something we should all be engaged in, but it's not something you can do with common sense. It's the racism is the oldest American value. It's the truest American thing. So we we ha, it, ha, it has scholars who go back centuries, and it's something we have to think about critically. And we should elevate the people with the expertise in doing those. I've been asked to do a, quite a few talks. Oh, be on, not let me stop. Not talks. I did a couple talks, but I've been invited to panels and things like that. Not like this, but other ex- experiences because of this work. And I'm like. And I just keep waiting for the other ball to drop when, like, I'm hoping that because Joe Biden's about to be president, people don't stop caring all of a sudden and for <laughs> this to be out of vogue. Because I'm like, we didn't fix racism by putting Joe Biden in office. So no, we did not. I'm, I'm happy for this influx of opportunity, but it also makes me a little bitter and sad that it took this. It took us to be killed without with impunity for it to change. I think, you know, every week or so, there's a new cluster hire announced ever since the demonstrations for George Floyd, Breonna Taylor. And while it's- Do you want to describe what a cluster hire is, Whitney? Oh, I'm sorry. So cluster hire is generally when an institution will hire um, two or more um, faculty at one time. Generally, this is um, framed around um, either sex, gender, race, um, to bring in a group. The idea is we bring in a group, let's say black people, um, then they would feel 
more, more welcome um, than just hiring one black person here, 10 years later, hiring another black person there. So cluster hire is bringing in a group of people from the same background um, and hire them around the journal, generally around the same, same time. And so since, you know, all these dem demonstrations and the unfortunate killing of um, innocent black people, we've seen cluster hires in the, from a lot of different academia institutions. And while, you know, one can say, you know, this is great, you know, you institutions are finally opening doors to people of color, you know, it, it does come off as, you know, we need to do this in this time to say that we're doing something. But my fear is as time go on, goes on, like Elle was saying, are they going to keep this momentum? Are they going to keep the same energy to, to continue to recruit and retain um, Black um, black scholars? Because at the end of the day, I don't want to be valued based off the fact that um, I'm not anyone's charity case, right? And so one one of the committees I sit on here, I you know, I'm like, uh, I'm on four committees right now. Um, and I'm at the point with L, like, run me my money or I'm not going to do it. And one of the conversations, we're like, okay, we can have this cluster hire, but how do we get people to come to Harvard? You know, it's a prestigious institution, but how do we get Black people to want to come here and stay um, when there's only one Black, you know, professor here or things like that? And so I think Black people right now are at, at a, a struggle in academia. We, we are finally being valued, but then we're also afraid of what that means once we get to an institution. Um, and so institutions should think about beyond putting up a post for a cluster hire or for DI, DNI committees and things like that. And it's also yeah, that, uh, uh, right. also that I think like when this happens, like I become the black person that you will measure all future investment in us by. Like if this cluster doesn't revolutionize, if those people end up leaving, it's like, well, that didn't work last time. And it's not that you failed, it's that they failed to stay. And so like that's like, sometimes it feels like a setup. And I think my perspective on it, and this is cynical, but I'm almost certain that this energy won't be kept. But what I'm doing at my institution, and I hope other people are trying to do too, is to force them to build in structures of accountability so that you can then hold them to the fire to re-energize them when you need to. Yeah, I I agree. We gotta keep them keep institutions accountable, right? Make sure that this passion and this newfound determination they have, you know, stays there. And I think going to that cluster hire that Whitney described, right? It's all about community, right? You're you're trying to bring in a community that's able to support each other. And I think one of the anti, like just anti community thing about science is that I feel like it has a real colonizer perspective, right? This is my research. You are my competitor rather than my collaborator. And like, I think moving forward, we have to take from all of these different cultures, the diversity of cultures and community and be able to build a science that is truly collaborative, that truly, you know, has people coming together to be successful. Um, and because I know there are certain institutions, right, that hire X amount of assistant professors and they're like, we only got one tenure spot for you four, right? Like how does that institution build that community when you're physically telling them, I'm pitting you up against each other. And I think that's one of the things that um, in science definitely needs to change and that these institutions and science in general needs to embrace um, a more collaborative community. Um, and one, to end on a relatively high note, um, one of the things that I've enjoyed um, that I've come across that is also resistance is black joy, right? Like seeing the posts that people are, like I'm thriving despite this country being racist. And, you know, I don't wanna dissuade anyone who's watching this and listening to our panelists to not wanna go into science, not wanna go into academia. Um, so can, we just go around and, you know, can you talk about something that brings you that black joy, you know, being a black queer scientist or just a scientist, right? And even no qualifier. Like what, what is some of your black joy that you'd like to share with, with the audience? I can go first. It's still, it has a somber element to it, but I recently 
published a paper on like racial inequity and fatal police shootings. And that's a tough topic to write about. But I, my team was a black woman uh, who's been my best friend for um, one of my best friends for half a decade was a black emergency physician who reached out to me and just has been giving me the most, the most powerful and, and like supportive mentorship I've ever experienced and another black doctor who's a leader in injury prevention. And so to do that kind of work, we talked a lot about black and indigenous health in that paper to do that kind of work with a team of people who you see yourself in, who you, who support you and in some ways love you in a way that you just, I've never had in academia before. And to see black people becoming like myself or already leaders in their field working together and doing impactful work, that gave me joy so that we were able to pull that off despite this world and what academia is. Awesome. Thank you, Elia. It's great when, you know, you're able to do great work around, like, with people that you're like, we are a community with each other. Um, would anyone else like to share a little bit of their, their Black joy that they've been able to experience? So I'll, I'll go next. Um, and this is uh, most recent. So when the quarantine happened, um, a group of um, Black postdocs here started Black Postdoc Association at Harvard Medical School. And it was, you know, brought me Black joy, but also it was a, a grim reminder that, you know, the, the amount of postdocs here that are Black are largely underrepresented. We're talking about 30 out of 5,000. And, but the community that was built from that is amazing. The, the amount of, you know, we have the ability to share our frustrations, but also to share what brings us joy to things that, you know, the music that we don't feel comfortable playing in lab or that people, people don't want to hear, or, you know, we could talk about the versus battles and different things like that, that we don't have the flexes, you know, we don't feel as open or environment to talk about with our lab mates we have on whether it's through Slack or something like that, you know? And so I think Every, you know, we speak about this all the time. Black people have the ability, no ma and this goes back to our ancestors, to no matter what the problem is, no matter what's happening in our world, we can build community and we can thrive off of each other. And I think that's what makes 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 all of us successful, to be honest, whether it's Black Twitter or our own personal connections that we've built and, and just being ourselves, whatever, whoever we are. Um, and I think that has brought me a lot of joy, just realizing that um, I have um, colleagues that are here and other people that are here that share my interest in science as well as personal interests. And that has brought, brought me black joy. Watching people overcome all of the issues that we've had in 2020 brings me black joy. Um, Sorry. I, I really have been enjoying the Black in STEM Twitter advocacy. It's just seeing so many different diverse people in different scientific disciplines has been so phenomenal. And so, um, I don't know, I really do feel like less a sense of isolation and like um, just knowing that there are, you know, Black and marine sciences, right? That was maybe last week. Just the joy of seeing people <laughs> in marine sciences um but it's just it's wonderful and i think that's really brought me the most joy black people chilling with the fishes chilling with the fishes <laughs> so good <laughs> so good yeah yeah um what's brought me joy is definitely the connections i definitely feel more connected more connected to the science world in general um but more specifically just finding other black scientists um like when whitney was mentioning having different Slack channels, um, one for like black postdocs, one for black women in computational biology. And it's just amazing just being able to connect with all of these different people. Um, and also what, what Derek mentioned as well, I'm, I'm starting to see people are um, accessing these different sites and I'm getting more emails like, hey, you should apply for this position. Hey, would you like to give a talk at this? Um, so that's what I've, I've really been enjoying. Also, this awesome. brought me joy okay. too. Yes. Just talking to y'all, like, yes, yes, I'm yes. like, this is the connections yes. and the shared experiences, and just to see y'all flourish in these places was just nice. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you all, um, you know, for sharing your perspectives, sharing your stories, being vulnerable with, with all of us. Um, I think one takeaway that I have from this is like definitely, you know, building that community. 
Um, so, you know, for all the viewers out there, you know, find us on social media, Twitter, you know, and like, let's further build this black queer community that we all have. Thank you, thank you to all those amazing panelists talking about how non-black and non-queer people can help share the responsibility of increasing black queer representation and how this can be applied to all minority groups. I think these changes can be applied in any place of work or life, regardless of whether or not you're in academia. So thank you also for mentioning the importance of mental health and why it's important to have allies be active in their intention to dismantle systemic racism and homophobia and transphobia. That is important. So now we will break for lunch, get something good, and we will see you back for our last panel on fostering community in academia and industry. I'll see you soon.
Welcome back. Uh, I am so happy that you are with us for our very last panel of the day to discuss the importance of how we can all foster community among black queer scientists. Here it goes. Well, hello everyone, and thank you for being here. And thank you for participating in our panel on fostering community among black queer scientists. My name is Aníbal Valentina Acevedo, and I'm an assistant professor at Universidad Central del Caribe Medical School in the city of Bayamón, Puerto Rico. And my preferred gender pronouns are he, him, and his. So before we start, I want to ask everyone to introduce themselves and to share their affiliations and also share their preferred gender pronouns. Uh, maybe we can start uh, with Ife. Sure. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Ife. I'm a pharmacology graduate student at Well Cornell Graduate School. I'm doing my uh, research at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. Hi, I'm L. Lett. I'm an MD-PhD candidate at the University of Pennsylvania. My PhD is in epidemiology, and I specialize in transgender and racial and ethnic minority uh, health inequities. Um, my pronouns are they and them. Hi, everyone. My name is Sahim, and I am at Genentech. Uh, I'm a technical development research associate, and my pronouns are he, him, and his. Okay, I'll go next. Uh, hi, uh, my name's uh, Dr. Antonor Othrell Hinton Jr., but everyone calls me AJ. It's a lot easier. And I'm at the University of Iowa, I'm a Bureau's Welcome Fund Ford, and he just postdoctoral fellow and also a postdoctoral fellow at Mayo Clinic. And I am also a rising assistant professor at Vanderbilt in the Department of Molecular Physiology and Biophysics at the Diabetes Research Center. Um, and it's nice to be here. Oh, and, well, it, it really doesn't really matter, but um, it's uh, my pronouns are he, him, and his, you know, so just whatever you want to call it's fine. I just don't really care. I don't really care. Uh, Hi, my name is Ashleen Williams. I'm an assistant professor of psychiatry at the Iowa Neuroscience Institute at the University of Iowa. Um, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. Well, thank you, everyone. It's very, very nice to meet, to virtually meet all of you. So uh, thank you once again for being here. So we would like this panel to be more of a conversation. And uh, we want to talk and, 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 uh, and discuss a little bit about the importance of community among black queer scientists. Why is important? What can they do to, to develop their community? And in the event that they can't have that community, what can they do to, to, to get that community? So let me start by asking one question so that all of you can share your perspective and then we can go from there. So when do we need to start fostering community among black queer youth? I mean, do we do it early in their training? Do we wait to middle high school or junior high school or once they get into college? What is a good and appropriate time to start developing this community among this uh, group of individuals? What do you think? Why don't you start aging? So, um, hi everyone. So I think that's a very interesting question because it's actually multifaceted. So I don't think we should start with youth. I actually think we should start with the previous generation, the people that are actually taking care of the youth. I think first the idea is to educate the mass about how to take care of youth um, and how to take care of intersexuality and queerness just in general. And that actually makes for a better environment for youth to exist that are queer. Um, and so that's kind of my answer to that particular part of it. And then the other thing is that I think incorporating education along the way um, primary level will help um, and I think that everyone has to kind of be acclimated together by uh, using it as is if it's part of culture in general in America um, yeah I don't think uh, the question for me is um, well I'll put it like this community is part of development and so like you don't I think for us to grow into healthy, whole, and 
individuals with confidence and capable of love and things like that, we need to have community throughout all stages of development. And so I, in many ways, agree with AJ in the sense that, like, these people should be, it's not up to us to make the community for the youth. We have to create a safe environment for them to develop their the, their community, which creates an which, which comes from an environment where they feel open to express who they are and then connect across those commonalities with the people around them. So in short, we need to make it safe for them to build their own community whenever they feel it's appropriate. And I, I guess another uh, uh, perspective I would add is, um, in addition to cultivating the community, I, I also think that um, role modeling and representation and visibility help tremendously. So for example, let's just say, you know, in your community or within your immediate family, you don't necessarily have uh, a safe uh, space to be able to like um, meet others and talk about these kind of uh, issues. Uh, at the very least, um, you might have a role model, you might have somebody who's reaching out who can help you uh, along your journey. Um, and I mean, that role modeling can look like a, you know, a lot of different things, but I think in a, in a space as um, in STEM, uh, as black queer scientists, engineers, et cetera, um, I think it's in a way that we give back, in a way that we um, help our local communities. Um, and yeah, just being a mentor and a resource for um, students who uh, maybe you feel isolated. Yeah, you're actually I bringing a lot of topics. I'm sorry, uh, you're bringing a lot of talk, talk, topics to him that we're going to discuss uh, further. So it's great. It's great that you're bringing the visibility and the mentoring. So we're going to get into that in a second. Sorry, Ife, uh, go ahead. That's okay. Um, I was just going to say that I completely agree um, with Sahim, AJ, and L. Um, I believe that you know, mentorship is so important and, you know, people, young people in high school, even elementary school, um, all of these younger years, they need someone to look up to, um, to kind of foster that community. It's very hard to do it yourself when, um, you don't see anything in the future, future for you, um, in the field of science. Um, I think a lot of young people just don't see themselves as scientists. So I think um, it kind of starts with us to kind of show the younger generation that this is possible. Um, there's a place for you here. What I'm hearing, I'm, it's interesting because um, sometimes we tend to think, uh, and we talk about fostering community as if it was something that we can just, you know, start doing and, and it's an isolated thing and, and, and it's not it's something what i'm hearing from all of you guys is it's something that we need to continuously work on and that different aspects of our society need to contribute to get a a, a, uh, a sensible community and, and, a, and a workable community so one of the things oh yeah no no go ahead one of the things that i wanted to add about that is um you know we we have ways of create a com creating community that are both large and small. So we can create community within our own lab spaces, right? All of us have been in labs where the labs are big, sometimes they're small. If it's small, you can create a sense of community just with the handful of people that are there if you create an open and safe space. And you can also think about how you're going to do that um, in a larger context. Systemic change is really hard. Culture change is really hard. It takes a long time. But you can be working on both of those levels at the same time. You don't have to pick one. Do you feel, do you feel that changes or steps uh, in like smaller steps, like you say, like in the lab or in your work or in your house, uh, what, you know, the outcomes can be stronger and more impactful uh, at that level than, than the bigger level? I wouldn't say that. I would say more that by creating, I think about this from the perspective of a psychiatrist, so I apologize for that. But I think about it that when you do these things in small environments, you get practice at having hard conversations. You get practice at doing things that are uncomfortable or difficult. And that makes it easier, I think, to take those risks in bigger environments. I don't necessarily think that the change, I don't think it can all be done in small spaces. That it's hard to gain visibility if everything you're doing is focusing on on micro interactions between you and individual other people. But I think it takes practice to get comfortable to to challenge the status quo. So, 
starting small makes it easier to say something bigger when it's time. I agree with that. All the confidence that I've gained in having public and impassioned conversations came from small interactions with mentors and friends who helped build me up. So I agree. Totally agree. It makes complete sense. Now, since you brought the, the, the topic of fostering community in our labs and in our workspace, uh, when it comes to black uh, sci queer scientists, I mean, how important do you think uh, is, is, is fostering that community? Uh, can you, all of you can elaborate a little bit more and how, how important it is for them, you know, not only in their professional lives, but also in their personal lives? So I'd like to go first. Um, it's an interesting question. First, I think in the context of a laboratory, I think um, from the very beginning, just culture in general for all people that identify as queer should be accepted across the board. But that's something that is taught through cultural competence uh, training. That's not something that's just like there, you know, and people know how to use pronouns correctly. People know how to be inviting. So that's something that has to be pushed from the actual institution. And then that creates some inclusivity to be able to actually start to make an amendable space for people in the lab. And that also intersects with just being black or any other particular race or being a woman. Now to get more specific about, you know, the black and queer part, um, that for me, I feel actually safe in my lab. Um, I guess because, you know, like uh, my boss is black, but he also understands the context of you know, being queer and actually accepting my identity. And he was like, well, do you need to come out to the lab? You know, I mean, we kind of already know, but like, do you, do you want to come out to the lab? And just having the, 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 you know, the support behind closed doors first and asking, is that okay to make an announcement in the lab? Or do you need help making that announcement if you want to? Um, creates a safe space. And so how it starts is with the conversation with the individual that you may assume or you may likely be and actually having it behind closed doors and asking what does a safe space actually look like for them in a laboratory. And then from there, try to create that culture together and compromise over certain things. So that's kind of like my you know little nugget on it. I think I want to inject a little specificity into the question because I feel like fostering community is a little vague. And so, like, is it that we want to have, are we, well, we could be talking about two things at least, making sure that Black and queer people have spaces to connect with each other, to have a, um, their own uh, space to, like, res to just deal with being in these majority non-queer, non-Black spaces and navigate them, or are we wanting to create a community where they're included in it. And I think both of those things are important. Um, as far as the inclusion part, again, how important is it? One way to think about it is that having Black and queer people in your lab, in your environment, in your institution actually improves that institution. Diversity breeds better educational environments, more progress, more innovation. And so that makes it important from the stakeholders in the institution from, for everyone. But also how important it is to, the, to be specific in your engagement and recognizing how your community needs to adapt to them is also another way to frame because Black and queer people experience different challenges in these types of environments. They experience different types of oppression. They experience different um, experience. They have experiences where like it's hard. Sometimes they're hard them to be seen, valued as scientists, to um, have their talents and um, acknowledged, to be have spaces to actually display those talents and like create opportunities for career advancement and promotion. So from both of those perspectives, either the contribution they give to your institution or lab, it's important to foster that community. And also from the specificity you need to apply to making them safe in your community, they're both important. Completely agree. I wanted to ask uh, either Elle or AJ. Um, so you talked about, specifically what AJ said, you talked about um, that openness from your boss and that, that inclusivity from your lab and that, that support that you got, how does that impact, uh, had, it had an impact on your personal life? Yeah, because <laughs> uh, there was many ups and downs. So I, I mean, you know, to be perfectly honest, you know, uh, he's seen me through a divorce. He's seen me through officially coming out. He's seen me through, um, you know, lots of stuff. That's why I'm so successful. Like, you know, I've 
I'm able to be myself. I remember, you know, inclusivity and intersectionality is creating a space to be yourself, really. And so if you feel included and you can actually be yourself, you can thrive. And it's the first time in my life, to be perfectly honest, that I'm thriving. I'm I do so many things. I mean, I'm not trying to brag what I do. I do like a shadow of like the Dean's Office for Diversity. And then I'm having two postdocs at the same time. And I'm running a lab at Vanderbilt. I have three people, you know, that I'm, that I'm hired. So hiring, we're working together. So it's interesting. And I'm not as stressed as I guess I was at the beginning of my postdoc, worried about so many life challenges. So the reason I say those things is because you have to have a space where you feel safe. And one thing goes down to is the emotional intelligence of the PI and the emotional intelligence of the space that's uh, a protected space that you're creating. So I think everyone has to do some mindfulness and emotional training to be able to be not just tolerant, but accepting of other individuals and diversity of thought. Um, so that's my kind of take on those things. And I, I kind of hope that everyone will be able to have that safe space, because even in my personal life, when there were challenges and things weren't right, my boss would be like, well, I don't have as much time as you need for me to, you know, to talk about this, we'll talk about it to make a check in. But then I'm going to recommend you to a mentor that can talk to you about this, because not every mentor can talk about every single thing. They can't have more than one mentor, right, to, to create certain spaces for certain topics. And then he was like, have you ever thought about counseling? And I really didn't, because in my opinion, you know, the black community, we just don't do counseling. So, um and, and so he got me to a place where it was accepting for myself to go to counseling. And then now, you know, like it's a normal thing. I love going to counseling um, and it, it's been beneficial and it's actually been beneficial for my partner too. So. Any, anyone else want to add to that? Uh, I'll briefly add uh, that I am trans and non-binary and I'm navigating my own gender journey, and my dissertation advisor uh, runs the gender clinic at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, I'm not her patient or anything like that, too old for that place, but um, it's just all of the education and the advocacy and the like knowledge that comes with her role has had many benefits on my personal life. And I don't think it's possible for your work life when you're in science, because science, especially like in the training or postdoctoral phase is so all encompassing in your life. It shouldn't be everything, but it definitely seeps into your home life. So, um, like it, de their, your relationship with your mentor network does impact your personal life. I don't see how it couldn't. And I personally have grown to a space where I actually thrive best with mentors who I connect with on a personal level. Like, my, the people who I really consider mentors, I have their number, we text, I check in about life events with them and vice versa. Like they are people who are a part of my life. And so, yes, it's no, it's not really as much division as maybe there should be between my work and like my personal life, but um, it definitely has had in this recent chapter of my life, a very positive effect. Sahim, let me ask you something. What about, because you coming from the private sector and we're talking more in, uh, about academia and the academic realm. So what about fostering community and what about the importance of community in, in, in the private sector, in, in, the, in the pharmaceutical biotechnological industry? I mean. Yeah, um, well, I mean, depending on um, the uh, company, there may be uh, what are known as employee resource groups. Um, so for short, we call them ERG, um, and uh, at, at Genentech, we call them, you know, DNA groups, so diversity network associations. So, so essentially, you have your affinity groups. And so you have, like, um, one for African-Americans, Latinx, uh, LGBT, et cetera. So, so those are, um, you know, a really great way to uh, build community and uh, to be able to um, meet um, others of a similar background to you. Um, and so those are those are corporate wide uh, or company wide ERGs, uh, but I'll say it, it is a little bit different from um, being involved in like a corporate ERG versus like your day to day interactions. Where let's just say in your you know lab or department. So in my case, it's my department. Um, there may necessarily be that type of community, right? I mean, my specific department we have over a hundred people, and I'm one of two black people and the only black queer person. 
So even if I have friends or, you know, uh, mem- you know, members of the black community or LGBT community in other departments across the company, I mean, Genentech has over 10,000 employees at our South San Francisco site. So, you know, it's really easy to fall into a silo. So in that way, um, you know, it, it really becomes somewhat of a grassroots kind of uh, effort where you have to be able to cultivate that space and to be able to create community for yourself, which, you know, in the context of my department, I mean, again, there's only two black people. So it's like, uh, it's a a little bit of a different conversation. So I think it it becomes uh, something even outside of us two and saying like, how do we engage our entire department, right? Um, How do we engage others outside of just black and queerness, um, other marginalized groups, et cetera? So that we can um, really all kind of benefit and thrive. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think it, it depends on which level you uh, which which level you look at it. But I think uh, for me, more meaningful is 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 in your day to day as well. Um, I had something I wanted to add um, about that because I actually recently pioneered a new um, sort of regularly occurring meeting in my lab. Um, We call it Culture Club. And what we do is we basically watch a film or a YouTube video. Um, It replaces Journal Club once a month for our lab meetings. um, And we have these conversations. And um, I started this after the whole Black Lives Matter uprising that happened a few months ago. And um, we I've been kind of just trying to talk about learning and unlearning and how, you know, important it is to kind of unlearn these things um, that, you know, may not be true. And we watched 13th um, to talk about, you know, police brutality, we watched Disclosure um, to talk about, you know, how trans community is portrayed in films. And um, I really enjoyed having these difficult conversations with my lab and even my PI um, has been very involved with them. And she said that she feels ignorant. Um, she said, I feel very ignorant that I, you know, didn't watch these on my own. Um, so I really feel thankful that I have a community, um, where we can have these difficult, um, you know, sometimes uncomfortable conversations. I think that's where the true, true growth happens. So Sahim, maybe you can, um, have something like that. (laughs) Well, I, I, I guess two things I, I guess I'll add uh, to that. So, so one, um, something similar actually happened in my department this year where um, after um, the, uh, I'll say the visibility of the police brutality cases uh, became at the forefront of the news, um, uh, it, it catalyzed some activity in our department. And I think the timing was really right because um, actually this past year, Genentech, announced its first uh, chief diversity officer. Um, and it's a black woman named Quita Highsmith. And so um, a lot of the groundwork was being laid for um, like these type of efforts, but um, like following the police brutality cases, um, we actually had a few members within our um, department who came together and said like, let's kind of form this DNI committee where we will have conversations like this and figure out how do we uh, advocate within a department. And so one of the uh, bigger pieces of deliverables we're working on is um, is like a is a, is a DNI survey where essentially um, they're working with HR and they will send out to the department and get feedback and find out what are some of those barriers and then also work on them directly. And I'll say that before all the conversation that happened this year. In my department, this really wasn't a topic. Uh, people were very much unaware of what's going on. So, I mean, this was a really huge step, I would say, for the department because um, I think, I mean, our, our department is diverse in, in a different way. I mean, we have people who, uh, you know, who immigrated or are first generation or, um, you know, come from all different backgrounds. The context of the issues in the United States really, in a way, are very um are very alien and foreign. And so I, I think uh, the, the way that it came together organically and kind of, uh, you know, similar to what Eva was saying about like, just you know, kind of, you know, coming together was very meaningful. And uh, yeah, there's been a lot of progress and I, you know, I would hope to see the same kind of activity happening, you know, in various communities around the uh, country. Ipe, I think that Culture Club is a phenomenal idea. 
Um, and it's, I think it's a great space to, to learn and unlearn a lot of things. So uh, I congratulate you for, for, for working on that. So we talked a lot about um, uh, fostering community and, 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 and but what about visibility? And, and it's something, visibility is something that, that briefly we, you, some of you have mentioned it before. So what about visibility? Why do you think visibility in many places uh, for black queer scientists is, is very low? What, what can they do to increase their visibility? What, what fears or what um, reservations uh, do black queer scientists might have that, might, that prevents them from coming out or that might hinder their visibility at whatever institution they're in? What's your intake on that? Are right, you muted, El? Go first, yeah. I think um, visibility is limited by inclusivity. Like, I don't think most people navigate the um, world not wanting to show their whole selves. I think that um, we have either been acculturated over our time in academia. Um, um, sorry, I'm in the background. Um, Sorry, we've been acculturated over our time in academia uh, to not feel safe being our whole selves, to not be out and proud, so to speak. And so I think visibility needs to, visibility will go as the culture changes. Well, visibility will come as the culture changes. And I don't think it's on the onus of us to be visible at odds with our safety. I think it's, on the, it's the onus of the institutions to make it safe for us to be visible. Yeah, I, I guess I'll add, I think there's maybe like two parts to it because I think there, um, I think in terms of visibility, some of the barriers that might exist is one, like for those who might have influence on who gets visibility, for example, like decision makers, leaders in the company may not necessarily be aware that um, like they're maybe not necessarily be as inclusive when they're highlighting, you know, different accomplishments or uh, giving recognition, so so so, I, or just highlighting different stories. So I think from a from a from a system standpoint, like if you don't have people in those places who are actually thinking, like, huh, you know, am I acknowledging all aspects of my of my organization? I think it's a missed opportunity. But I think there also comes a piece of like, how do you advocate for yourself? And I think that that comes with a sense of confidence and a sense of knowing who you are, which, you know, like, I mean, I think for most queer people, it's a, it's a journey that you're continuing to uh, move along. So I think it can be really hard, you know, if, um, you know, for example, you have your own kind of internal issues that you're dealing with, you know, how, how can you, you know, speak to, um, you know, a, a group of people if, if you're still working things out. So I, I think um, just being uh, comfortable in your personhood is really important, but I also think that just the reality of the space we, we work in, and I'll at least acknowledge for you know Genentech. I mean, like you know, keep us busy. <laughs> so you know, you're you're working on your career, you're trying to just you know, you're doing well and, and keeping up, and so um, maybe you don't necessarily have the energy or time to be able to be that vocal and be that visible, right? Maybe you're still working on things for your own, for your personal development. So. Um, I think it's a cadre of different things that can that can serve as as barriers. But once you do have that sense of self and you own it, I mean, the the opportunities are amazing, um, as we can see on this panel today. <laughs> um, I would like to add a couple of things. So one thing is that I think that there's not institutional support. So, for example, let's say at I there is a little bit of institutional support in the context of an LGBTQ hospital. Um, so or clinics. And so I think that speaks volumes to where people can start to feel safe. So actually showing that the institution cares about you, not in the context of just, you know, um, oh, check mark, check mark. We have another, you know, minority and now we have a double minority. So this is great. Um, actually, you know, putting some worth and dollars to what's going on. So I think the best way for institution to actually represent how they can support someone of a queer background or someone that's specifically black queer and black trans is to actually put institutional value there. And so that requires endowment money and also shifting the culture. And so 
Uh, one other thing is that, you know, um, at Iowa, we have safe zone training. Um, so we're doing pretty well with LGBTQ issues. And then there are allies that are visible. So there are people that uh, wear um, ally badges or have ally um, stickers on their doors throughout the university. So that's a safe space. But also, there's not the only thing that can be done. So that's a, a you know level one approach, right? A level two approach is in the context of having institutional commitment as far as training. So I'm I'm big on these training things because like then there's no excuse. So if everyone has you know the institutional training and it becomes required because it's something that that needs to happen for you know um, a person to get tenure, you know all these things can be instituted via the board or a president. I mean, it requires input from the university. So this is all universities. Um, and if that happens, then there's no excuse for, you know, certain microaggressions or macroaggressions, um, because then now they see that there are consequences for their actions in the context of like, oh, I can't do this. So at least at work, there is some safety. And at least at work, there is some visibility in the context of the institution, which allows for people to feel more safe and come out and, you know, exist. Then there's the institutional barriers within science. So that's a whole nother level that people are still trying to knock down. I know plenty of black, um, queer and trans individuals that did not want to participate, like um, when Ryan was organizing, didn't want to participate because they're protecting their identity. Um, although we know that they're, you know, that they're, you know, black, queer and trans, you know, um, and they just didn't want to come because they were protecting their identity. I mean, think about that. It's the context of protection that's most scary. So if the scientific community at large, the powers that play, the HHMIs, the National Academy of Sciences, you know, the Presidential Mentoring Medal awardees, these type of individuals, if they're not going to stand up for more inclusivity in science, then it will hurt us in the long run. I mean, kudos to the NIH for making a sexual, gender, and minority office, but more needs to be done at all funding sources across the board in order for everyone to feel safe and just be more of an afterthought and not really discuss. It's kind of like, oh, you're queer? Who are you dating? You know, it's more of a, you know, it's more of that one of those versus, you know, oh my God, we need to stay away from the queer person. We need to stay away from the trans person because I don't understand that. So it's really about intentionality. And that also comes down to the mentoring of the heads or the boards to actually mentor the staff and the rest of the institution to create that infrastructure and space. Yeah, I think you, you highlight some I was going to say, I think that you've all highlighted some really important points. And I think one of the things that concerns me the most is that, you know, from a company like Genentech or from University of Iowa, you can have an individual person in leadership who's really pushing for inclusivity. But ultimately, the decisions, at least at an academic center, about who gets promoted, who gets noticed, who gets rewarded, comes from these funding agencies who really have not decided to invest in changing their value systems, right? So I'm, I'm right now, I'm missing part of a scientific meeting to be here, wherein they've really decided to focus a lot on diversity. And they challenged the heads of various um, NIH institutes to talk about what their institute is doing about diversity. And it's, it sounds like they're thinking about doing something, but they aren't actually doing something. So I find that the, the scientific community is that, that level of um, commitment is really hard to figure out how you're gonna, how you're gonna make that happen. Because at an individual institution, I think it's a bit, I don't wanna say it's easy, but it's a bit easier to apply pressure because you know exactly who it is who's in charge of this funding or that organization. And you can go directly to them and say, you know, these are the things that I think need to change. The, the culture of science um, is much more nebulous, I think. Yeah, and I, I, I agree a lot with what AJ and Ash, Ashlyn, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Ashlyn. Ashlyn, thank you for correcting me. I, I agree with a lot, but I do want to actually push back a little bit against the sort of individual confidence narrative that uh, uh, Samir was uh sort of speaking about, I think that is important and that it might be necessary for someone to be visible, but I actually don't think that's a core 
question, core thing that holds back people from being visible in the sense that I think visibility, what is the utility of visibility? It, seeing someone like you gives you the confidence to um, be more yourself in a space and also speaks to the values of the place you're at and that they are they have created a space where this person who is queer, who is Black, is comfortable and flourishing and successful. And so I think when we um, talk about confidence to advocate for yourself, you make the onus on the individual. You put the pressure on them already marginalized to change the culture, which is unfair and also unrealistic because we can't, we didn't build this system in this flawed way and we can contribute. We can help guide it to a better destination of inclusivity, but we actually don't aren't often equipped with enough power to make those changes happen. And so we have to have stakeholders from all around the community. As, as Ashley was saying, we need to have the funding agencies to advocate for us. We need to have people in the C-suite at our institutions to, to speak and declare that diversity and inclusion is a core value. And then you will get more people to actually be visible and then you'll create safety for them to be visible. So I actually wanted to just kind of respond to that a little bit. Unfortunately, unfortunately, you know, in certain places, uh, higher visibility might mean uh, lower chances of survival. So, so I, I completely agree with both of you. Like, you know, what do you think about yourself? It's really important for you to become visible, but in certain places, you know, you might, you, you might not be able to afford being visible if you want to survive. Uh, yeah. yeah, and I, I guess, and I guess, just to contextualize that, I think that is, um, I think that is that is like the, the the specific case, right? So, what if you don't have these things available, right? What if you're in an institution that does not uh, value necessarily inclusive inclusivity, or the infrastructure isn't in place, right? So, then what do you do, right? And, you know, and at least in my experience, the reality is that it's a very isolating feeling and like it, it kind of takes a sense of just like being comfortable with yourself to really speak up and, and, and kind of say something. And it's not necessarily saying that that is your own ownership. It's more like what are, what are, the, what are the considerations in the visibility of, of uh, black queer people? And I think, yeah, the, 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 the reality is that we are in these systems that um, are gonna take a lot of work and it's not gonna happen overnight. And so um, I'm not necessarily saying if you know, uh, a black queer person doesn't you know, become visible or speak up that it's their fault, but I'm saying that what can help and what tends to help in these instances of people being visible is top down, but also you know, bottom up where people you know, do have a sense of, of you know, confidence. And maybe, maybe that comes not from the infrastructure or the system, but maybe that comes from community right or what have you um so just to kind of uh maybe add a little more uh context to that i thought i want to apologize for getting your name wrong sahim oh no worries <laughs> what what about uh having a mentor or mentoring i mean it's something that we briefly talked about or mentioned before so what about the 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 role of, of, of having a mentor that is a black queer scientist and, 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 and improving your visibility or improving the visibility of, the, of, of this community? That's far. And uh, so I'll just be honest, that's hard to find. That's like, it's yep. right? very okay. hard to find. Okay, so you have to become your own mentor and advocate. And then you find little, you know, inklings and little pieces of people inside you know of you and you say okay let me latch onto that for that particular aspect of me right but um it's hard it's really hard i mean i like i know a couple luckily um and i have some peer peer mentors that are at the same stage as me that are black and queer or black and trans and they decide to you know talk about certain things behind closed doors but may not be visible but that's a whole other thing within the black community it's at large um, so it's very hard to find a role model that's out and that's killing the game in science, right? There's, there's several, but I mean, like huge individuals, right? You know, or that at least identify with, you know, some aspect of being on the spectrum. They, and there's, there needs to be more thought behind, you know, what we represent as scientists and who science deems important in the context of research sometimes. Um, and so in order for us to have mentors, we're going to have to maybe stretch the bounds of what we may think is novel science by 
for example, like um, some people may be doing sickle cell anemia and some people may think it's not important. We may have somebody that's a leader in the field that actually, you know, black and queer that could be, you know, a role model, but people don't think the science is directly affecting, you know, the, the nation at that moment. So like, for example, if we had like someone that was a researcher for COVID, like, you know, Kazmika Corbett, and let's say, you know, this is an example, this is hypothetical because I don't know her sexuality, but let's say she was queer. Now she's on the front page of CNN, Fox News, you know, NPR talking about COVID. And then now we have a visible mentor. But that's not happening at a great rate because there's not an intersection between science and then also the media or policy to where they bridge over enough to actually create a narrative for black scientists just in general to be deemed as scientists. If you remember, um, I don't mean to throw shade, but the time that there was individuals that were interviewing Kazmika, they called her miss instead of doctor. Um, and so that's something that we have to address. So if we can't call a black woman by her title, how do you think we're going to even be able to have the conversation to start talking about mentors and role models that are black and queer? Because that's a, another separate topic that the media deems um, a, you know, a conundrum, something that they don't want to unpack. You know, they have strong doubts about it. And so we have to be really careful about in the context of like, what is mentorship for us? There isn't mentorship for us. We're creating that narrative and it really needs to be talked about. Like, I really feel, I really feel like, you know, the next time, like one of these, you know, big journals wants to do, you know, a black, you know, article, we have to really talk about maybe creating space for intersexuality or at least, you know, at least to start the topic, but queerness and trans and what does that really mean? And then where do you find mentors? There, there needs to be a best practices for being black and gay, you know, in my case. But, you know, that's and that's in everyone's case, you know, for whatever part of the spectrum they represent. The role of mentoring and how important mentors, important uh, how important mentors are, are in, in in creating or fostering disability or fostering community among Black queer scientists. So mentors are super important, but I think it's unreasonable for, and I and I caution against up and coming Black queer scientists to expect to find Black queer mentors. It's a numbers issue. It's a minority tax issue. It's just. A challenge. It's possible and you will be lucky, but I think you should frame it around instead. And how I chose to frame it for myself was building a mentorship network, identifying people. It's, it's, it would be great to have Black queer mentors, but it's at minimum, you need mentors who can understand the unique needs for Black queer scientists when it comes to people advocating on their behalf, when it comes to people um, fostering type of interest that if they're in like health equity space, being able to like speak to those equity related projects and support Black queer scientists and doing those. But you need somebody who either has that background or is educable, where you can mentor up and teach them what you need from them. And you need to assemble a set of people who can advocate for you who can help mentor you in science, who can mentor you in balancing your work-life balance and your personal life. So I think everyone needs to think about it in terms of a mentorship network as opposed to finding your one mentor who you're an identity match with, who can help you, who can guide you along and basically help you build your life. Because there might be white male scientists who can find that, but it's just not realistic for Black queer people to do it. And Having a mentorship network also gets you to start um, building up the social capital that's often denied to Black queer people to have access to more spaces where you can assemble power and be and build your successful academic career, if that's what you're interested in. Well, I, I wanted to comment on that a little bit as well, Elle, because I, again, part of this uh, conference that I was at was where individual NIH directors were showing the numbers about the rates of grant funding success for people based on their um, race, ethnicity, and um, identified gender, although they did only talk about males and females, but whatever. So they talked about the fact that um, there were all these initiatives and there are initiatives that they are still working on to try to increase the funding that goes to people who are black, who are Latinx. But what they found was really interesting was that um, a lot of the funding that people got was predicted on their social network, 
who was their fan, who was their, um, you know, group of people who wrote a collaborator letter or something like that. And so I think, um, yes, it would be wonderful if people, like you said, could find, um, identity and kinship with their mentors. And I think that ultimately, even with all of the efforts that we make to try to um, improve the numbers, humans think about things in terms of their networks. And they think about things in terms of like who they know and, and who the big names are. And as much as I don't like that, I don't know that that's going to change. So I would I would encourage people to, to try to figure out how to build that network. Because like you said, social capital in science is huge. And you can build that um, if you make an effort toward it. And I want to add to that. I don't mean to monopolize now, so I'll be quick, but that is where allies come in. That is where people who aren't Black, who aren't queer, have power to change the face of science. Could reach out to your colleagues and connect them with your mentees. It doesn't even have to be for something tangible and explicit. It'd be like, hey, you should know this person. You got to educate. And as, as we are assembling more power and becoming more senior, that's what we have to do. We like have to reach out to our network and tell them, hey, I know this mentee. You should connect. That kind of stuff. Because it goes deeper than what you just missed, Lisha. If there is a racial, gender, and ethnic bias in grant funding, there's also, but even some of the and prob some of the problem is who they have at the table structuring their interventions. Because one of the interventions that they have, like supplements to NIH grants that you can uh, call diversity supplements, but those are gatekept by the PIs. So you're having this majority white body of PIs who decide this thing that is designated for diverse populations to allow to change the face of medicine, but you have a gatekeeper who doesn't necessarily is necessarily trained on supporting those people or invested in them. I have an ex I know an example of a friend who was a budding star essentially, but and they and their mentor held over their right to this supplement and kind of abused this person because they um, couldn't write the, they wrote the application they gave it to the mentor to submit, but they refused to submit it for arbitrary reasons that were uh, in some ways racially influenced. And so I'm and had someone like me or anyone who kind of specializes in, I don't specialize in diversity and equity, but I have engaged in that space. But people who know this field, because diversity and equity is a science, it's a field, at the table when they design that intervention will probably have said, maybe that's not how we should do this. And so part of this is like us being in those rooms to help to tell them how to fix things and also just helping people expand their networks, sort of like you got at Dr. Williams. I got to go back off your idea. Um, that was good. Uh, and the reason being is well, lots of things, but the key thing that I like to talk about is like access to funds. Um, in science, even uh, us as individuals, when you make it to postdoc or transition to faculty, people are not aware that supplements can actually work for postdocs and faculty. So a lot of times there are a need for black queer and trans scientists and black people in general to get to the next stage. And so there's an elimination of people getting to the postdoc and then advancing to faculty because there's not funds. And so one thing is that we have to be more willing to allow for scientists to realize that a NIH supplement is not a bad thing. It's a way to access and increase the, the, the face of science to be more diverse. And so I think that's one thing that we have to be more welcome to. And we have to be more honest about it by having the NIH and other branches of funding that do similar things um, to talk about this and talk about the need for diversity supplements, but also at the same time, maybe put in like a couple of thousand extra dollars so that PIs will be willing to do that. And that's discretionary. So there has to be kind of change in how like maybe they act, you know, they, I guess they allocate funds to a PI for certain things. And then maybe it becomes more incentive or goes back on the institution, if you get a diversity supplement, then you, you know, you get this amount of money. So sometimes there has to be a matching that's done um, as well. So I think it also falls back on the institution to, to access greater mentorship. So, uh, you know, if a trainee gets an award, then they should award the, the, the student or the trainee, depending on the stage, and then also the PI. So then mentorship becomes more intentional. Um, it, it, it goes back to money and dollars at, at the end of the day, just to be perfectly honest. If black, queer, and trans people were the highest, um, acts of the, the greatest diverse 
you know, class of individuals that could get people the check marks on their IMSD grant or their marker rise, and they would be going after us. They would be like, okay, yes. Um, it's, you know, it's, it, it, it really matters. I mean, how, how you see people. So I was going to uh, ask as, as a concluding uh, or closing question, I should say, uh, how does non-black queer scientist help but, I mean, you've, you've already uh, sort of answered that. Uh, but is there anything else you want to add on that? Because I think uh, your comments have been on point. Uh, it's not, uh, there's a lot of, of things that, that other members of the community can do to help. Uh, and this is not, all these issues that we've discussed here are not only, uh, not only affect black queer scientists, but it affects minorities, uh, minority scientists in general. So what can non-black queer scientists do to help what we are. Call for changes in like specific changes in your departments and institutions. Like, and don't just like give us more, get more, be more diverse. Like that's easy to not respond properly to. But like say, hey, I heard about these diversity supplements. I think y'all need to add another person to your grant coordinator officer's office who specializes in helping us. Um, apply for these. So it's like, because the thing is, I'm on a, I'm on a diversity supplement or two. Any PI with the, one of the big R grants or can apply for these type of supplements and fund for years or at least, well, it, it yearly renewal, a student, a minority student on their grants as an extension. They give you more money to fund the student. It's not coming out of the act original grant. And so just say, hey, we need to build up infrastructure so we can start um, doing this more robustly because PIs are not going to often, um, you're not going to get systemic change where people who are already busy and who aren't true stakeholders have to do a lot of work. But if you make it so that they can do something, do good in a sort of easy way, then that changes things. And so build up the infrastructure to take advantage. I, I, let me just step back and make it sort of brief. Think of diversity, equity, and inclusion as quality improvement. Where can our system be made better to do this better? There's money out there for these students. We need a matching system where like, oh, we can do, we can now take on, if we apply for more supplements, we can take on more students. Let's start recruiting students and match them with PIs to write the supplements together earlier in their graduate career before they switch onto PI funding. Those kind of things. So just advocate for more resources, administration, more resources like as far as like administrative staff to just support these things. And then actually just make it a priority by speaking directly to your chair like, this is something that I think is important. Here are some things we can do. Make this happen. Anything else? Just as a, or your concluding remarks on, on, on this particular topic. Yeah, I, I could add it. And, and it's a theme in, um, in, the, in, the, in the conversation previously is, um, so there's an idea of mentors, and then there's also the idea of like what we call sponsors. And so like a mentor is somebody who you can work with directly and who can give you guidance and advice. But a sponsor is somebody who advocates for you when you're not in the room. And I think having a mix of those in your uh, network um, really helps. And so in terms of the role that like non-black, non-queer people uh, can, can, can play a role, I think those are two very like... Uh, uh, clear examples, right? Uh, being a mentor or, or being a sponsor, right? You know, maybe when somebody's not in the room, you say, hey, you know, have you thought about this person or this work, right? And really uh, fostering inclusive inclusivity. Um, I mean, outside of that, there's also just being able to continually engage and volunteer, right? I mean, you know, we all mentioned some of the ways that we are fostering community, we're engaging, Right there's actual groundwork that has to be done to push these efforts. There's root, there's top down, there's a lot of it, and you know, unfortunately, it tends to fall on minorities. Right, what we sometimes know as like the minority tax. So, 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 being somebody you know who can say, "Hey, how can I help?" Right? How can I continue to support? Right? How can I learn? So, I think there's a lot of a lot of ways uh, to be able to 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 really play a role. Um, I think it's just being able to seek, to, to seek, to seek those opportunities um, and to continue to build on it. It's a journey. No one's going to necessarily like learn it overnight and know exactly what to do. 
Um, I mean, shoot, we're all kind of learning this, but I think a first step kind of goes a really goes a long way. Yeah, I completely agree. Well, and, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was really excited. Uh, the closing thoughts made me think of something else. I also think that we have to have resilience and grit. It comes down to actually, do you like minorities or do you not? It's really the thing that has to change. So the culture really has to go back to the beginning. Um, I, I think it's up from um, uh, Baronda Montgomery's papers. Uh, she has so many. But if you Google uh, Baronda Montgomery and uh, MSU, uh, you can find some papers. But she talks about grit and talks about mentor stewardship. And so we have to be able to use the mentoring network to create better more rounded mentors. And that means in your mentoring network, other mentors should know who they who they are, you know, mentoring and and who's in connection with them. So then if someone doesn't know that technique or someone doesn't know how to get to sponsor you to another level, they can reach out themselves to mentor to mentor, peer to peer, and get you what you need. So it has to be that not only are you trying to cultivate your degree, but the resilience has to come from the sponsorship and the network itself. So there are more collaborative networking meetings where it's you and your PI with the other mentors that you're mentoring team so that they can provide you everything that you need. And the other point is the grit aspect. It is, it is time again, when I wake up in the morning, I'm dressing for success because I'm black. And then I'm dressing for success by sometimes hiding who I am because the spaces that I'm in don't allow for me to be all of who I am. For example, my staff scientist is my partner, but when we're at work, of course, I mean, you know, you have to be professional. But let's say I want to hold his hand coming into work. We can do that because we're perceived as, you know, not scientists or we're perceived as those minorities that you know, participate in, you know, these things. So, you know, need for people to realize that grit, the determination, the resilience, the perseverance, all of those things combinate, you know, culminate into one thing, have to come from inside. So that means that you have to create the space where you either accept diversity or you change to learn how to sponsor your own self to create a space for diversity and then seek out trying to help in a mentoring network. So, so we have to change all together. It starts with just, do you like minorities? Do you different and then asking questions and going down till you get to the point where it's like okay now minorities let's start accepting these different identities and these intersexualities it has to it, it, it has to change in order for us to completely agree with all that so i would like to uh finally finalize this panel by thanking each and all of you Thank you for your time. This has been a great and phenomenal conversation. Thank you for your willingness to participate. Thank you for sharing your perspective. Thank you for being here with us. So uh, again, thank you, thank you very much. I want to remind uh, the audience that if you want to share a comment or if you want to send a question or get in touch with any of the panelists, you can do so by sending an email to the following address. I'm gonna spell it. That it's B-Q-T-H S-T-E-M, again, B-Q-T-H-S-T-E-M at gmail.com. So once again, thank you everyone. This has been phenomenal. Have a great day.
Thank you to all of our panelists on our last panel on the importance of how to foster community, finding your tribe, and again, how allies can be effective mentors and create a safe space for those to find community. Um, we hope that the audience can see themselves in these panelists and know that there are a lot of brilliant, talented, black queer scientists just like them out there who, um, who, are, who are just being, who are brilliant. Um, our hope with this town hall is that this will inspire queer youth to show them that if they want to go into STEM, they have every right to and can succeed. So if you have any questions or want to reach out to one of our panelists, please email bqthstem at gmail.com so we can forward your questions to our panelists and be sure to follow them at their Twitter handles listed under each of their names. Thank you again to the organizers and sponsors for making this event possible. So next, to end off our fabulous day, we have some wonderful performances by some talented local Philadelphia entertainers. So head over to the Zoom link that's been provided for an amazing show and support your local drag performers in these very hard times, which means tip them at their Venmo. Okay, uh, we have performances by Vinchel, Sardonyx, uh, Icon Ebony Fierce, Tiffany Uma Mascara, and I cannot wait for the show. I will see you over there. <laughs>